What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 42 of the Drunken Boxing Podcast, coming to you from a lockdown and somewhat gloomy Beijing. I'm recording this intro over what would be the Thanksgiving weekend, and although I don't celebrate it, I want to first of all wish all of you that do a wonderful Thanksgiving. As usual, let's jump right into some Mushin martial culture news. I released a Senki video, which has footage from a trip I made last summer to the famed Shuaijiao legend Li Baoru on the south side of Beijing. I was going to do follow-up interviews with him and release this footage and more uh, with that, but the pandemic measures have delayed that. So I have released a short video where you can see what Shuaijiao culture looks like in everyday life here in Beijing. I also released a short glimpse into Ba Gua Zhang lesson from the Hua Jin online learning program. It's from a lesson which covers one of Liang style Ba Gua Zhang's Dan Cao Ba Shi, or eight individual drills. This one being Feng Lun Pi Zhang, or Whirlwind Chopping Palm. Go check it out. I also released episode six of the ongoing story of Ba Gua Zhang. This episode briefly discusses Li Cun Yi and the Chinese Warrior Society and how this later influenced the Nanjing Guoshu Institute. And then it focuses on the Guo family and their Ba Gua which has its roots there. There are two episodes left in that series, and then I have some of my own interviews, etc., to release thereafter. If you haven't watched the first few episodes of the story of Ba Gua Zhang, I do recommend you check them out. All right, as usual, another way you can support this podcast and my endeavors in general, such as my YouTube channel, etc., is by buying some of the merchandise I offer in my Teespring store. I have just released a Ba Gua Zhang themed tea and hoodie, this features the drawings from the 1936 manual on the application of Bagua techniques by Yen De Hua. Those images are timeless and make for a great looking t-shirt or hoodie. I have released the tee in a sublimated printing version, which is a very high quality print which does not wear off, as I have been told by some of you that some of the older designs had this issue. So to that end, I will be re-releasing all the tees in this sublimated printing format as well as the hoodies thereafter. This new Bagua Zhang design makes a great gift for someone else or yourself to consider over this festive season. The store can be found on Teespring at the link listed here and in the show notes. Another way to support my work is through Patreon. There are general support tiers through which you can do that and any and all support is highly appreciated. Additionally, there is also a third tier, the Hua Jin tier, in which you can study the arts of Xing Yichuan and Ba Gua Zhang in depth. There is already a vast library of released lessons for both Xing Yichuan and Ba Gua Zhang, as well as their related Neigong, Kung Fa, and other practices. So if you're interested in learning Xing Yichuan or Ba Gua Zhang, give the course a try. The Patreon site may be found at patreon.com forward slash Mushin Martial Culture. That's Mushin Martial Culture, all one word. Alrighty, let's get into today's podcast. My guest today is my good friend, Graham Barlow. Graham and I met online years ago and have built up a good friendship through discussion and interaction online. He is a Tai Chi and Xing Yi practitioner and teacher, as well as being a BJJ black belt, and he is based in the UK. He runs the Tai Chi Notebook podcast and blog site when he isn't busy choking people on the mats and selflessly spreading the art of murder yoga to the public. I always wanted to hear more about Graham's background and experiences in the arts, and we finally got around to doing it. So I give you Graham Barlow. Okay, welcome to the Drunken Boxing Podcast. Graham Barlow, we've been threatening to do this for a while, and now we're actually doing it. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm okay. Um... It's funny that it's called the Drunken Boxing Podcast because I did all my drinking last night. Oh, okay. So it's the Hangover Boxing Podcast. <laughs> it's the Hangover Podcast for me, yeah. <laughs> I was at an award show in London. Oh. Um, yeah, some uh, journalistic thing. Right. For magazines. I work in magazines. Oh, so, okay. Uh, occasionally those magazines have award shows. And I get to turn up and uh, and there's a free bar, which is <laughs> always bad for the day after. No, it's, it's all right. You got to do that sometimes. What do you actually do? What kind of, I mean, are you in a specific magazine or a few magazines or? What's so I work that? in uh, the UK technology sector. Okay. So it's consumer magazines. Um, and the company I work for has basically brought every magazine that's left in the tech space. So there's a couple that we don't do, but mm. basically any technology magazine you buy, Mac, PC, 
Linux. Oh wow. Um, you know, PC components, that side sort of stuff. I mean, there's a couple of magazines in the US we do as well, which is Maximum PC and Mac Life. So uh, shout out to those guys. Okay. Um, a lot of US um, people don't know that magazines still exist because they don't have the same. Um, in in Britain, it's there's news agents everywhere. Right. And you can you can see magazines on the high street. You, they're physically there. In the US, it's much more subscription only. So, if you don't see them all the time, you don't know they still exist. So, wow, <laughs> it's it's hard to get the message out sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I did notice that. Like, I mean, that's it's kind of a worldwide thing. But it's nice to hear that you guys still have newsstands and things like that over where you are. Because I used to yeah. love. I mean, that was one of my favorite things when I was younger. Was uh, was reading and uh, buying magazines and collecting even magazines of a specific topic. Um, yeah, it used, to, it used to bring me joy. Before the internet, this was how we got our information. Yeah, before that, we used pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> Owls. Out of world. <laughs> yeah. All right, so maybe you can do a brief introduction. Well, it doesn't have to be brief. It can be as long as it needs to be. An introduction of yourself um, for the listeners out there. I've been on your podcast before. Um, but this is the first time you're on mine, so go ahead. So I guess your listeners would probably know me, if they do know me, from my podcast, which is the Taiji Notebook podcast, or my blog, which has been going for oh, about five years now, mm. which is the Taiji Notebook. Um, and that started off as just somewhere I put my training notes for what I what thought great deep thoughts that had occurred to me while I was supposed to be training. Right. I was really thinking deep thoughts. And I kind of needed an outlet for those things and I just started to write them down um, and it became a blog. And then I just started writing for the blog because I'm a writer, you know, and I, you know, I, I do uh, technology writing mainly. Yeah. But um, these days I mainly manage other people writing. So I needed some sort of outlet for my own writing and it, it turned into this blog. So it was... Um, in a way, it's therapy, isn't it? It is. <laughs> got, but it's a very good training somewhere. habit. It's a very good training habit. I mean, notebooking of your own training. I'm not saying it has to be made public. I'm just saying that notebooking and keeping notes of your own training and your thoughts through training and either, you know whatever, whatever comes to mind, whether it be something you've understood better or a thought or an idea or even a question, notebooking is a really good way to get good at martial arts. So. It is. Um, you can solidify things when you write them down, I think. Yeah. It helps to uh, vague concepts that float around in your head can be kind of turned into more real, substantive thoughts, and mm. you know, which lead into different ideas for training the next day. You know, that kind of stuff. For sure, but it also cements it in your own psyche. I mean, having to mm. formulate a way you might have an understanding if you think about something, but then having to write it out in a clear way makes you think about how to write the words out in a clear way which then makes it clearer in your own head and you remember it better so exactly that is the basis of my blog that's what happened okay. um, uh, i i still tend to muse about things that have occurred to me in training but i also comment on different issues in the martial arts a lot um yeah a lot on um Suza Daung when all that was happening yeah wrote about that um i tend to i tend to not restrict although it's called the tai chi notebook i don't tend to restrict it to tai chi um i also practice brazilian jiu-jitsu i also practice shingi and choli fat so i tend to focus on those type of things mm. um but i write about a lot of stuff i've written a lot about systema things as well and i've interviewed um rob poyton who's one of the uk's leading systema people on my podcast as well yeah. and i've got an interview coming up with matt hill a friend of mine who's one of the other big UK players. Uh, so that's coming up soon. Yeah. Well, let's... So I like to that, keep that, it varied. That's quite interesting. I mean, your, your blog is varied. Your podcast guests are also varied, even though it's called the Tai Chi Notebook Podcast. So, I mean, that's pretty good. Um, but, you know, what's your background that, uh, that, that... Well, you just mentioned some of these arts that you practice. So maybe you can, you can talk mm. a bit about your history and your background. So... Um, I was never allowed to do martial arts as a kid. My parents really? didn't like the idea of it. So I was always frustrated <laughs> martial artist as a child. Mm -hmm. I used to watch the, the Kung Fu TV program with David Carradine. And I thought that was just brilliant, you know, and that was what I wanted to do. What was um, their, what was their um, resistance to it? What was it for? Why? I think it's, 
it was outside of their worldview. Oh. Like, well, oh, I don't like the idea of you learning how to punch people, Graham. You know, that, that, that type of thing, you know. Um, and I came from a, like a little tiny village in the middle of nowhere, sort of on the North Wales border. Okay. So it's not as if I had Kung Fu schools on my doorstep anyway. There, there was nowhere to train, really. The only thing available would be something like uh, Japanese Jiu-Jitsu or Karate. Mm. That would pro- and then that would be pushing it. Um, I remember when I used to play badminton with my dad, I used to go to this badminton club, and at the same time there'd be a karate class happening on the other side of the gym. Mm. Um, and that, but I mean, basically that guy had about five students. <laughs> it, it wasn't. It wasn't a big Not deal. Big. Yeah, yeah. And it didn't look like, and it didn't look like the sort of thing I wanted to do anyway. I had this. Uh, I think because of watching. Um, Kung Fu TV program. I had this irrational uh, dislike of Japanese martial arts. Oh, I see. Um, well, I, I was thinking about this in preparation for the podcast because they, 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 they are a bit stiff sometimes. When you see karate done, it's it's kind of a very stiff, rigid thing, and they're sort of doing katas up and down the hall. Mm. Um, and there was always this idea, this Bruce Lee idea of be like water, my friend. It's superior. It's um, you know, it, it's a better way of fighting, and I don't. I'd always gravitated towards that. Well, that's um, quite interesting that you could identify that difference in character at that you know inexperienced and young age. Yeah, but I guess it's a part of the propaganda of that TV series, isn't it? It that, is. <laughs> that Chinese <laughs> things were superior to Japanese yeah. things, and I, and I, I unthinkingly accepted that for for many years, which is ironic because. I now do jiu-jitsu, which is Japanese in origin. Right. So I, I've learned to uh, open my mind and eat my words. Well, I mean, there's um, stiffness in uh, in many different arts. I don't know if we could... That's why, again, internal, external, hard, soft, all of these these titles, personally, I think they're they're mostly moot. I don't, I don't like them. Mm. So mm. I know what you mean. Like, you can have internal arts that look incredibly stiff. Right. And you can have external arts that are really fluid, so yeah. it's that's that's not the distinction they're making, I think. And it, people, you know, they just associate soft with flexible and hard with stiff, and right. that's not always the case at all. Right. Um, I mean, we've, we've seen I've seen Shaolin Shaolin guys that are fluid as water, mm. you know, doing forms and things, and that's meant to be an external style. So exactly, uh, yeah. Yeah, so it doesn't make sense. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, so we where were, was I going? You were going. Where was a, I going with that? You were saying you were telling me your background, and then I interrupted you, asking why your parents were against it, and then we ended up in the badminton <laughs> hall. So yeah, yeah, ended up in the didn't we? Yeah. yeah. So I did badminton as a kid. So okay. I, was, I was active. You know, I was a, a like a an, an active sort of. I like doing physical things. You know. Right. Um, and it wasn't until uh, like after university. Um, I started to get, I got I got the opportunity to do Tai Chi. Mm. I just saw an advert for a Tai Chi class in the university. Um, and it said, this, you know, in this hall at this time, just turn up. So I turned up. Um, and at this point, I'd read a bit about Taoism. So I was, I was into the idea of Taoist philosophy, of the hard overcoming the soft. Again, this is the same philosophy that came from the Kung Fu TV series. So yeah. I'm completely on board with this idea of uh, you know, all you have to do is relax and you know flow with the movements. And I'm not learning something basic like karate because that's just low level. So I was like, oh, this is Tai Chi. This will be good. Um, <laughs> and I got there and it was good, but it was completely not what I expected. I walked in and there were people breaking slab stones on each other's chest with a sledgehammer. Very Tai Chi. Very Tai Chi. <laughs> it turned out that they were rehearsing for a demo they were going to do okay. um, later on that year. And I just sort of, and, I, and the, the bloke said, oh, just sit down there. And I, I formed part of the audience that were watching. So I was like, it was like a trial of their demo. Mm. And they were breaking bricks and breaking curb stones on, on the head. And I was thinking, what the hell is this? You know, like <laughs> I had turned up for some Tai Chi. Um, it just happened to be that night they were, they were practicing. Okay. But I trained with those guys for about nine months um, and I got to know them pretty well because like any Tai Chi class at the start, there's about 20 people who turn up. Mm. Week two, there's about 10. 
week yeah. three there's five and then week four there's four people but those four stay stay yeah. forever you know and I was one of those four so you, you get to, I, there were three teachers there um, Donald uh, Douglas and Jonathan who were students of a man who later became my teacher but I hadn't met at this point okay um, so they taught me Tai Chi and it was very martial there was sparring it wasn't like put on gloves and hit each other as hard as you can sparring but it was like sort of just touching sparring controlled very but, controlled yeah so no power you could yeah. go fast but you couldn't put power into it okay um, but they also they taught all the applications of the moves and everything it was exactly what I was looking for so there was like you know takedowns and throws hmm. um, and all that kind of stuff um, and then I moved away and kind of lost contact with them. And I thought, oh, it don't, doesn't matter. I'll just, wherever I've moved to, I'll just go and take up Tai Chi there. So I, I moved down to, uh, well, first up to Manchester, then back down to Bath, which is like a tourist spot in the UK. I don't know if you've ever been there. I haven't, but it's, I've heard about it. Yeah, it's, it's like a Georgian city. Uh, so it all looks beautiful and um, Bridgerton. That mm. Netflix series is all shot there. Oh, okay. Um, it's that, it's that sort of. You know, there's always a film shoot going on just around the corner of wherever you're walking. Um, it's that type of place. It's picturesque. It's it's very picturesque. Yeah. So I got a job there working for this media company that I'm still with. Um. And, I thought I'll just go to the local Tai Chi class and it'll be like it was in London. Yeah. And it turns out not all Tai Chi classes are the same. Did you did you walk in with your own bricks? And they looked at you like you were crazy. I, I walked in expecting some sort of like, you know, a bit of rough and ready push hands where you end up on the floor every now and again. And yeah. No, it was just form and uh. endless repetition. And, uh, and when they did the applications, it was like they just used all their strength. Um, and then I suddenly appreciated what I'd been learning was kind of real Tai Chi, where they were they weren't just muscling everything; they were using posture, and coordination, yeah. and the flow of the movements. And I thought, oh, I I had it there, like that was my chance to learn the real stuff, and I've lost it now. And I drifted around in various different styles. I trained a lot of different Kung Fu styles because it turns out Bath was actually a uh, like a little hotbed of martial arts classes at the time. This is okay. in the nineties. Um, there were, there were you could you could do most styles there. It was pretty good. Um, so I tried all different things, um, and then eventually uh, the internet happened. So like suddenly the internet's the thing now, and I managed to look up the old people that I used to train with, and it turned out they were students of this guy, um, Sifu Raymond Rand, who uh, had another student in Bath. Oh, interesting. It was just a complete coincidence. So I hooked up with him. I said, oh, I, I, I used to train your style. And this student was someone who trained with Sifu Rand back in the 70s. Oh, wow. For a while. And then had lost contact with him for about 20 years. And then had made contact again. So he was essentially starting from the beginning again. And so was I. So we were like a good match. So he decided to get us together to be training partners. Um, and run a class in oh. Bath uh, under him. Although he lived in Wales, so we saw him at weekends. It wasn't like we went to see him all the time. Right. He kind of teaches us both together um, over a weekend. You know, how how go... far is Wales from where you were? It's about a two-hour drive. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's not, not, not it's close, not impossible. but not, not ridiculously far. Yeah, you're not going to be doing weekly classes uh, yeah. at that distance, but... Um, he was old friends with this couple, um, Leila and Phil, who were in Bath, and they were like friends from his university days back in the day. Mm. So he'd quite often come over and stay with them for the whole weekend anyway, and then I'd just go round to Phil's house and we'd train in the back garden. Oh, that's you know? nice. Yeah. Yeah. So that was good. And then we'd occasionally get together as a big group. So the guys from London, us, and my teacher, Sifu Rand, would all... Uh, like do a weekend like a couple of times a year um, up north actually in a place called Oncot which is a tiny little nothing village somewhere in the Peak District um, wow. so we used to used to kind of bring all the students together there 
and we'd all train together, you know. And we did a bit of there. We do we do more things like full contact, um, where we put on headgear and gloves. But like, what would you call sandar today? Mm. You know? um, right. That kind of stuff. Except I, I, I really didn't like the rules they used because they they were essentially no rules. Right. So you, you could kick each other in the groin if you wanted. So you, <laughs> it, oh. I, I really didn't uh, didn't like the because that in that sort of situation you you rely very much on like if he does that to me I'm going to do it to him. So you both don't do it. <laughs> right. There's like a gentleman's agreement or understanding. Yes, it was yeah. much more like gentleman's agreement. I I would have much preferred if we'd had um, you know rules that weren't so street. Right, and, and more sport. Um, and I did raise this as a point with with Sifu Randa. He disagreed. He he thought that if you disallowed kicking to the groin, people would get sloppy about their kicks, which is a fair point. Um, like if you leave the, if you leave your groin too open as you step around and kick people, you're um, going to get kicked in the groin. You're going to get in real life. You're going to get kicked in the groin, right? Yeah. And he was much more interested in real life martial arts than sport fighting. So he didn't want you guys to develop bad habits, which is a exactly. fair point. It's a fair point. It's a fair point, but when you're the guy doing it, you, I, 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 I didn't like it very yeah. much. But he said you're not meant to like this full contact stuff. You're not meant to do it all the time. You're meant to do it a few times, so you've got a, an appreciation of what it's like when someone is really trying to hit you. Right. Which is why we did it. We didn't do it for for fun essentially mm. um which is it's, it's just a it's a different approach to training and uh it's fair enough yeah i mean yeah. I, I got knocked out once uh doing this um because we did it on a hard floor um and the guy i was doing it with i went to throw him with osoto gary yeah as i now know it to be called but at the time i just thought i'll just sweep his leg <laughs> but as you know it, it's very reversible yeah yeah so especially if he's got the right posture Exactly, and this guy had done judo for five years, which I wasn't aware of. So my my like I I did a couple of punches, I got in really close to clinching range, so that was all perfect, and I thought, okay, logical thing to do here is this is a throw because I'm I'm at clinching range. He's a slightly off balance, dazed. Um, I'll go in and throw him. So I went in to throw him, and he just judoed me, <laughs> and he uh, he judoed me very hard. It wasn't he didn't. Um, you know, you also to Gary, you can put people down and you can kind of smash them their down. Descent. Or you can, yeah. yeah, or you can smash them. And he, he absolutely landed on me. You know, how you, people land on you and they land on your ribs and they right. crush you. Right. He did that, but it was on a, oh, it's basically some, I, th- I think it was a cement floor with a uh, laminate wooden uh, paneling over the top. Which like is a parquet like, floor, right? Yeah, like half a mil thick. Yeah. So basically, my head banged on. I was wearing a helmet, but because my head banged on the floor and bounced, it concussed me, and I was out. You know. Um, yeah, yeah. Looking back, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> if, if I could go back, I'd have, I'd have gone. Look, if we're gonna do, like, fighting on this floor, I would rather we either use mats, or don't do throws. You know, yeah, it's a bit of a, that, it's a big one. risk. It's a very big risk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but you know, it's all the price of an education, isn't it? It is, but also I think you're going to be quite hesitant on that kind of a floor anyway. So, um, well, I was naive. I should have been hesitant. Yeah. I should have been much more hesitant about trying to throw somebody, especially he did. I didn't know he didn't judo. That was I, if I'd known he'd done judo, I'd have gone nowhere near him. <laughs> You mean he didn't have a big he didn't have a headband on with a Japanese uh, sun on it, no? <laughs> I wish he'd been wearing a gi or something. I don't know, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, what but, style was this of Tai Chi that you were learning? I mean, what... okay, so this style is an unusual style. Hmm. Um, it comes out of Hong Kong, okay, essentially. So it is the style that. Kuyu Chang or Gu Zhang. I'm yeah. probably butchering both pronunciations because one's was well, this how they're written in either Cantonese or Mandarin yeah. versions. Guru Zhang. He was the, yes, there you go. Yeah. You're someone who can say these things properly. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, he was known as the King of Iron Palm, and there's that amazing picture of him breaking all those a pile bricks. Of bricks. Yeah. Yeah. Um and everyone kind of thinks, oh it must be fake, but I I really think he did that. Um there's also pictures of him 
with a car um, on top of his chest, and he's lying there, kind of waving at the camera. Um, and th those cars are the those are like nineteen thirties cars. Those solid, are heavy. yeah, solid. Yeah, cars. those aren't those aren't modern cars. You know, there's difference. Yeah. So I mean, he was, by all accounts, like you know, the man. Yeah, he so was he, very well known for his Iron Palm. Even up until today, his Iron Palm was... I, In fact, I, I follow his uh, Iron Palm uh, Diedajo, or the, the herbal tincture. I used mm. his recipe to make my uh, my Diedajo. Well, the variation thereof, but it was predominantly based on his. Yeah, see, the Diedajo recipe is something that is guarded uh, jealously by every teacher I've ever met. They all have their own, like their sort of family style of... Of recipe and stuff right um even my teacher has a, a dit da jiao recipe that comes from that line so it went from all the way down from him to my teacher and he, he has never told me the recipe <laughs> it's so <laughs> secret <laughs> but the thing is i i'm i'm completely impractical when it comes to making things like this so i would never be able to make any anyway i've got some that he's made in a bottle mm. and it is really effective for injuries it is um, it whenever is whenever i sprain something in jujitsu i put a bit of this on and like the next day it's almost gone yeah it's, it's like wonder fuel it's it's just amazing it's surprising though that he can get all the ingredients there i would have thought that a lot of them would have been banned or not you wouldn't be able to buy there them. are there are lots of chinese herbalist shops in britain okay uh, i don't whether there's banned things in them i don't know uh, i guess not or if there are banned things he didn't put them in right um He's he's a vegetarian, so I don't actually. He's he's really down with the old, uh, you know, tiger livers and all the rest of it. Yeah, um, well, it's got it's got uh, vipers in it. It's got seahorses in it. It's got oh um, it's got something called tubia chong. Tubia chong is a wingless cockroach. I mean, there's quite a few um, obscure things. Yeah, straight. <laughs> that's why I would have thought. I'm sure that some you might have to have used some. Uh, yeah replacement for some of the stuff you know maybe he has I mean, things i don't know because i've never seen the recipe <laughs> yeah 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 I get but it. i know he made it in a bath like he made a, a whole bath of it right and then like scooped it all up into into bottles sort of, you know lockable bottles as well because it's poisonous so if you drink it you oh you'll you die know, you'll die yeah, yeah exactly so you have to keep it away from kids and you've yeah. got to keep it on the top shelf and all the cupboards and all that kind of stuff yeah I make um, I make five liters at a time, but that's yeah. that's that lasts a very long time. But you know I've got one batch of five liter a five liter bottle that's been sitting in there for, with all the stuff in it for quite a while. It's been brewing for years now, so it's pretty potent right now. You know, so you could just leave it like that, just basically sitting with, with uh, you know getting stronger over time, and then you just yeah. bottle it as you need it. The bottle I've got, I've had for years, and it's still going. So yeah, um, doesn't see it doesn't appear to go off because there's alcohol in no, it. No, well. it's a high level of alcohol in it. Yeah, I can. You can. You open the bottle, and you can smell almost like brandy. Just yeah, yeah, hits you. It's a high level of alcohol. It's uh, a lovely smell, though, actually. And um, see, Matt, uh, see if you ran with those. Every time we smelled it, you go, "Oh, this reminds me of Master Lamb's shop." Oh, okay. The whole place would smell of this. Yeah, like everything would smell of this, because you know they they used it all the time because they were, yeah, they were, they were training harder than we did back in the eighties. Um, I'll get on to who Sifuran learned from later on. Where did I get to in my? We were talking about Guru Jung, and then we sidetracked onto the Diadajo. Yeah, there are, yes. So, um, so he was one of those the, the five tigers who went south. Yeah. part of the. Um, the Cowman the uh, the government that you mean the Republic the Rep Guomindang Guomindang yes he's yeah. part of the Guomindang uh, and he he was part of the whole movement to use martial arts to strengthen the nation and you know so that they could so China could compete with the the modern world yeah the, the Republican era right. mentality yes yeah. exactly so he's and I'm, I'm just sort of but this is from my own historical research, not anything that is passed down in our, in our lineage, but mm. that, that's where he came from. So he was very into cross-training in other things, mm. and he was always looking out for other martial artists to train with. I mean, he was the original mixed martial artist, I guess. Right. Um, 
whenever he met somebody who was good, he just wanted to learn from them, as far as I could see. And he got a very close friendship with Tam Sam, Master Tam Sam of Choi Fut. Ah, oh, okay. So they would they actually ended up swapping students so that some of that lineage could come into both of their styles. Okay. So there's always been a close connection between... Uh, Guru Zhang was always uh, Northern Shaolin, and Tam Sam was Choi Fut, mm. and you always find them tr- the, uh, boxing Choi Fut, and you okay. usually find Northern Shaolin and boxing Fut are trained together in the same style because of this close association they built up. Oh, okay, um, that's very interesting. And Master Lam, who was the uh, was our connection from Hong Kong to England, he trained in both as well. Um, He's not known for his Northern Shaolin at all these days, but uh, my teacher says back in the day, he could do these incredible spinning kicks and the going, jumping high and going really low. I mean, it's really known for its flexible oh, okay. kicking techniques, Northern Shaolin. Yeah. And he could do all that. It's, it's just he couldn't teach it to Westerners because we weren't flexible enough. We, you know, it, it just, it, you need to start very young to do usually yeah that's actually that what's sort of that's that's one of the things that they would usually teach the younger people first is uh, what you'd call shaolin because it is uh phys- physique building it builds flexibility strength explosiveness it's got acrobatic which you should do when you're younger so mm. yeah yeah and it's a good foundational basic in terms of just getting your body to be pliant strong well you know the usual aspects that we refer to in modern sports like flexibility endurance strength you know those 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 aspects are quite well trained yeah but yeah you, you know you know there's another aspect to guru Zhang's history i don't know if you know uh, some other issues regarding himself which was actually mm. pretty common back then but um he was an opium smoker yes i believe he was yeah, that, that's not really talked about in our lineage, but I think he was. Yes. You don't, they, they don't advertise that as one of the one of the 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 aspects to to tell the public. Our oh, grand teacher smoked opium. Oh, of course, they don't talk about it. Yeah, but yeah, it was but more so, common so than people man. think. Yeah, yeah, it's more common. Did, didn't they? <laughs> it was more common than people think. So yeah, yeah, that's that's. Yeah, I mean, Ip Man was a notorious opium smoker, wasn't he? And, uh, right. The thing is, Guru Zhang's death is never really. Um, the people never dwell on it how he died mm. so I wonder whether it was something to do with opium or it's quite possible he was killed off in a cultural revolution because there's certainly nothing you hear nothing about him after that I don't remember which year he passed so I wouldn't be I wouldn't be I, I mean it's it's so it's, it's, it's people have different dates for when he passed away so it's almost like there's something, there's something they don't want to talk about, which would make me think it's a cultural revolution. Yeah, but that um, would that so would be that would be pretty pretty then. more uh, recent if it was then. Uh, well, it's the sixties, wasn't it? Well, the, yeah, but the the actual the, the the years of that type of persecution was more in the seventies. So um, there was, of course, internal you know problems between. Uh, proponents of the one party and the other and infighting and you know um what's the word people being persona non grata because of their political affiliations more than yeah more than and he was on the wrong side of history because he was part of that republican yeah movement. exactly so yeah the communists you know hated all that so yeah yeah so yeah a lot of people were targeted simply because of that i mean my grand teacher my Xingyi grand teacher was on the wrong side of that as well and you know mm. he had a lot of uh uh, he was persecuted. He, I mean, we, we, he, he died early because of damage he got from Red Guard's um, beating. Uh, you know, they da- damaged his uh, kidneys and he died an early death due to that damage. So Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a collective trauma, that period of time for the Chinese people. Mm. And they, you can understand why they never want to talk about it. Yeah. Because it was a time when... Basically, ordinary people were forced to commit atrocities to each other. Um, yeah. You know, how do you get over a trauma like that? But well, I don't think you want to talk about it very much. You'd rather forget the whole thing, you know. But you know, I mean, I don't. I know this is we're, we're going to be talking about martial arts, but it's actually funny watching a similar mentality rise up now with the lockdowns 
and um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it really I mean people standing at community doors with red bands on their arms and and scolding others and not letting them come into communities and you know like it's all very communist isn't it yeah, well it's it's just like I'm like what do you first you know you're doing exactly the same thing again what are you doing you know um, mm. but anyway let's hope it, it ends quickly I mean, they'll see me coming in and they'll be like, oh, foreigner, come here, show me your, you know, your, your green code. And I'm like, hey, man, I've, I live here. Yeah, show yeah, me your green yeah. code. I'm like, I've lived here as long as the building's been here. What are you checking me for? You know, <laughs> you know and, 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 then, and then there's others, there's others coming in and out and they're not asking them anything, but they're like, you come here. I'm like, oh, okay. That's nice. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. But anyway, back to your teachers. So so okay so so he's his uh another another friend of his was Sun Lo Tang so him yeah. and Sun Lo Tang were involved in in promoting martial arts together hmm. so I think they trained together quite a lot and Guru Zhang's Yang style that he supposedly learned not from Yang Cheng Fu hmm. but from his father who was Yang Lu Chan's son um an older style of Yang style. Okay. He mixed it with a lot of Sun Lu Tang's influence. Okay. So our style is it's a, it's definitely a Yang style, but the footwork occasionally looks more like Sun style where we, we put both feet together. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So it's and and the the stance is not as you know Yang Cheng Fu style is quite big like it's a when they do a bow stance forward it's a big step forward mm. ours is more medium okay um i think it the idea is that you 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 know if you're fighting with something it's more you don't want to do these huge stances all the time mm. which again is another kind of sun lu tang thing he was much more smaller stance well i mean his his tai chi was hugely influenced by his xing yi so when we look at his his Taiji Sun style Taiji, there's a lot of influence from from Xingyi predominantly, and of course some Bagua as well. Mm. Um, so he was hugely influenced by his his predominant style. I know a lot of people don't like to hear it, but his predominant style was Xingyi Quan. You know, it's the yeah. style he studied the longest. It's the style he practiced the longest, um, and it's obviously the style that he had had the biggest influence in him from was Xingyi Quan. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I think your first style is always the one that, you know, defines you. Right. And everything else after that is influenced by it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Like, especially people that have done karate first, uh, and then they learn Tai Chi. That Tai Chi, for years, it it has a sort of a slight karate tinge to it. Mm. You know, it's, it's really, it's almost impossible to get rid of whatever style you learned first, I think. Right, right. Um, so... I don't want to say that there's any Shingi influence in our Tai Chi at all, because I mm. don't think there is. But I think there's definitely a northern Shaolin influence because it comes from Guru Zhang. Mm. I, I don't think... I, it's not like we do a move out of northern Shaolin in the form, mm. but I, I think it's impossible to ignore that influence as well. No? Um, Can you hear me? So there's a, there's, a, there's a few bits where we go quite low, and I just kind of think, if he'd never done northern Shaolin, would we be really emphasizing the lowness of this posture <laughs> oh, okay so uh i think it's got a little bit of a, a it's, i think it's an influence of everything he did basically sure but it's, it follows a yang sequence and it's it looks like if you had to if you looked at it and said what's that you say yang style right yeah well i mean as you mentioned you just said like uh, your first style is going to influence everything you've done but so is your experience so is going to be uh, physical aspects of you know some people have a, a inability or an exceptional ability so maybe they have something that they cannot do or something that they do a lot better than even their teacher could do in terms of physical aspects like maybe they're more flexible or something or less flexible and that's gonna influence even how their students learn it from them so yeah that would make sense so if his if his underlying style you know had these these characteristics for sure if you there's a there's a he published a book in the oh was it the thirties or the forties something like that um, of his Tai Chi form 
and you can see it on brennantranslation.com. Oh, he's got it there. Can, okay. And it's got yeah, it's got photos of of him doing it, um, and it doesn't look. I mean, the thing is, to get to me, it's gone through one, two, three, three other people mm. at least from him, and his his version of it is very stretched out, very elongated, okay. and very Shaolin looking to me. Um, as someone who does the same style, and it doesn't really look like his postures in the book anymore. So things change over time. Yeah. But I can recognise that what he's doing is the form I do. Oh, all you know, right. It's, all right. You know, it's, it's the same form. His, his emphasis was a bit more Shaolin-y, shall we say. Mm. Um, so that's where our Tai Chi comes from. It comes from him. He set up a school in Hong Kong. He had two main students, which was Yim Shin Mo and Lung Se Chung, both of which I'm probably butchering in pronunciation again, <laughs> um, because pronunciation of Chinese names is not my thing. I'm not very good at it. Um, yeah. But is, these were yeah. in Hong Kong? These were in Hong Kong, yes. Okay, so this yeah. The I, 50s. I'm not going to try try to decipher the name, because it might even be a Cantonese pronunciation. I don't speak Cantonese, so... Yeah. Yeah. So... And there are pictures of these guys training on rooftops in Hong Kong in the fifties. Uh, they they all wear suits to train it, which is <laughs> really it must have been the thing people did at the time. Um, it just looks really weird. But again, I you can recognise that's our form. Um, you know, I can see what these people are doing. Well, that's actually pretty common. Talking about people just wearing whatever they were in in the day and then training. I mean, that's actually pretty common. More common in the past than today, because nowadays people are like, I've got my training clothes. But back in the day, you just trained in whatever you were wearing. And a lot of the people trained either before work, so they'd go there to train and then go to work, or directly after work, so they'd finish work and then go and train. So they weren't going to change. So they would just train in whatever they were wearing. And you'll see it pretty common. They'll be wearing suit pants, leather shoes, and a button-up shirt, and that's what they're training in. But they've maybe rolled up the sleeves, you know, and that's about it. Yeah, but that's very common. That's that's pretty common. Mm. So it could have been that. Yeah. Um, so those two people were the teachers of uh, my teacher's teacher, which is Master Lam, who learned as a youth from those two, right? Mainly, I think. Um, but he got the whole range of skills. So it was Northern Shaolin, Iron Palm, um, Choi Foot, Pole. Particularly pole. Okay. Um, very good with a pole. Even today, I do not go near my teacher holding a stick. <laughs> it is fatal. Do not do it. <laughs> he will take it off you and hit you with it. <laughs> and you won't be able to stop him. That's the other thing. And that stick uh, <laughs> training or the is staff training is coming from Chole Foot? Is it a Chole Foot? No, it's, a, it's its own style. Ah, okay. It, Yes, um, 16 and a half point pole technique. It's a really rare style. Um, my teacher's really open with teaching everything he's done to anyone except the pole style. Because it's just really, it's it's like his precious thing, you know? Right. It's, um, it's, it's I, precious. I've, 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 yeah, it's, it's my precious. <laughs> <laughs> but And also because it's dangerous. Like, he. If you start, it's it's basically fighting with a pole without any protective gear, mm. which you know you, instantly your knuckles are going to get wrapped continually. You're going to end up with arthritis when you're old. You almost have to sacrifice something to learn it. Um, it's it's not something that's easily taught in modern times. Well, we say. the name Liu Liu Dian Pan Guen was six and a half point. Uh, um, Staff is it's quite a common name. I mean, it's it's Wing Chun uses. No, it's, it's sixteen. I think. Oh, sixteen. Okay, yeah, sorry, 16 I heard six. Yeah, oh. sorry. Okay, all right, sixteen and a half. All right, yeah. Yeah, because so each one of those is a technique, and there's one technique that's half a technique, so it's the half. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I haven't heard of sixteen and a half. I thought I thought I heard six. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, I really hope I'm not misremembering that, and it's not twelve and a half. It, <laughs> well it's a while since i've talked about it but i because i don't practice it well maybe so maybe I, with it with inflation it's gone from 12 and a half yeah to <laughs> exactly 16 and a half but i mean the, the name it almost isn't important because it's just the number of techniques that you get taught okay um you know there's the techniques have names like meeting slipping um 
that kind of stuff. Right. But he he won't teach it to people um, readily. You know, he taught he taught me and Damon because we made an effort to learn it. Right. Uh, but we we got we got to about we got to about eight techniques. But we 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 weren't going to a regular class or anything. It was just when we saw him, mm. um, and we didn't. Uh, at, at eight techniques, if you're not practicing them all the time, you can't get good at them. Of course, they're, you know because they're 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 subtle things with weapons. Are, you know, as you know, that the bare hand, the movement is gross and exaggerated compared yeah. to weapons. Like sword is tiny movements. Um, pole is even. It's like spear. It's even tinier little movements. They're little subtle things where you just deflect slightly and, and make a circular motion, and move something that way and then hit. Mm. And though you can't do them solo, you have to do them with someone else because they're meaningless solo almost. Yeah. Um, so it's a difficult thing to learn, and also it's dangerous. Like, uh, you know, apparently Master Lamb would not let them wear even gloves. Oh, he said you can't wear gloves because you'll get lazy. It's the same attitude habits. again. You'll get lazy. Yeah, yeah. You ha- you'll get bad habits if you wear gloves. Um, but they used to sneak things on, like <laughs> Superman would tell me that um, what they do is they they turn up wearing trousers and they hide shin protectors under their uh, like trousers <laughs> without telling him. <laughs> well, the shins are the shins would be covered, but the hands, I'm sure, got a, took a beating. Yeah. Yeah. So that. And he, you know, and, and I, I think he's, I think he's probably suffering in his old age with fingers mm. um, because of that training, um, and he, he doesn't recommend doing it to people because it, you know, the, 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 the risk reward benefit isn't worth it really. Okay. Um, nice. He, he let, he let me, he let us put gloves on and he let us put eye protection on and you know all the stuff so you're not blind and you don't have arthritis in your hands so. exactly yeah so I, i've not been damaged so um but then again i never i don't i wouldn't profess to be good at it or have trained enough in it to to be anywhere you know i, I just don't mention it mm. to well here i am mentioning it obviously but uh yeah yeah it was just you, you picked up on it as it just one of the things that he taught so um, la- this this teacher of your teacher he came over from hong kong and was teaching in england yeah, this is like the end of the 70s, start of the 80s type okay. time period. Um, he was one of the first people. He, he was actually employed by the London, the Inner London Authority to teach Tai Chi. Okay. Um, so he did that, and that's where he met my teacher. So my teacher had previously done Japanese Jiu-Jitsu up to Black Belt, and at the just like the time at the time he got his black belt, his teacher retired um, and left. And the guy who took over wasn't the same, and the club didn't have the same atmosphere, mm-hmm. and it all kind of fell apart. So he was looking around for something else. Um, and that and training jujitsu back in those days was no joke because they didn't even use mats. They used to do throws onto wooden floors. You know oh. that was just the way you did it. Yeah, I know. Can you imagine? <laughs> it just sounds horrendous I mean if there's um, if there's four people showing up to the Tai Chi class I'm sure there were two people going to get thrown on those floors regularly uh, <laughs> yeah but I think but the thing is that, that that's the the type of people you get going to Tai Chi class are not the same type of people yeah of course you got going to a Jiu Jitsu class in in the late 70s mm-hmm. in Britain they, right. they, they, they wanted a good old scrap you know it was yeah. those sort of people right right um, they were more hardcore um so, so he'd done all that. He'd done after after his club kind of disbanded. He started looking at Chinese arts, and he found Wing Chun, which he really liked. And he did six months of that. However, anatomically, every time he straightened his arm, which you have to do when you punch in Wing Chun, um, or the traditional Wing Chun that he learned, yeah, it kind of clicked his elbow. Oh, and he okay. said, "Look, every time I do this, it hurts." And he asked the teacher about it. Um, and the teacher went, this star's no good for you. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, he just went, look, this, you can't fix that. If, if if popping your elbow straight to punch hurts you every time you do it, you're just in the wrong style. Uh, so, <laughs> which is refreshingly honest, isn't it? It is. It is. Um, I don't know. Does your teacher still have that issue with his elbow? Um, well, he stopped doing Wing Chun, so... It's not an issue. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but they, you know, they do that sort of that chain. When they do the chain punch, and they kind of pop the arm. Like yeah. Pop, 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 pop. 
that action did not agree with him anatomically. It was just it, you know. Right. So he he basically took the guy's word and like, well, I need to find a different style then. And he was looking around for Chinese stuff, and he'd kind of basically given up because he couldn't find anything that he thought was good. Right. Um, and then he just managed to run into Master Lamb, and it was like the right teacher at the right time with the right student and destiny like, bang or yeah he just went all in basically so he basically trained full time for about 10 years wow um master lamb so he became what you would call an indoor student but they didn't have a ceremony or anything in his yeah. lineage it wasn't like that it was but he became one of the inner circle um where he just got he got taught for free but he was shown and he was shown everything mm. but it kind of comes with a a price of you're also expected to carry like, it if on. I phone you up at if I phone you up at eleven o'clock at night, I need you to come over and pick something up for me. Yeah, I know. Just do it, yeah. and you won't. And you won't argue. Yeah. You know, it, it was is that sort of very traditional. Well, that's that's is actually what a you know teacher disciple relationship is like. So, you know, mm. it's closer than close. That's what people don't exactly. Get. Uh, yeah, exactly. It was it was that very. It's a very intense close relationship. Yeah. Um, you're basically at the teacher's beck and call, and you're and and if you don't do something they want you to, to do, then and there they kind of get this sort of look, like a frown, and then <laughs> maybe they won't teach you much for a week or so until you kind of come back into the good books. You know, yeah. um, it's a bit like that. Uh, but the, the 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 positive side of that is that you are you're taught everything with no holding back. Mm. So he got all that great teaching that had come from that lineage, which was, um, and Master Lam had also been um, doing each one, oh, okay. getting into each one with one of Wang Shangzhai's students, which was Professor Yu Yongnan hmm. um, in Beijing. So he'd been, he'd been corresponding with him over a period of years and eventually was taken on as a student. So he'd also incorporated the sort of, what at the time we called it Qigong. Hmm. But you know, there was the standing postures. Yeah, Jam Zhuang. And associated, yeah. We call it Jam Zhuang these days, but then they would call it Qigong. But if you say Qigong these days, it can mean anything, can't it? It yeah. can be like, um, you know, movements and jumping around like an ape or whatever. You know, everything's, everything's Qigong these days. It doesn't, or yoga is Qigong, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's lost, kind of become. It is, it's kind of become a its meaning. Yeah, it's been. They've been used it for everything nowadays. It's overused, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, I mean, the original, older term wasn't qigong. That also is a is a product of the qigong craze, to be honest. But yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, you're right. It didn't exist before. Right. Like 1950 or whatever, did it? So well, like, it, maybe it existed, but it wasn't used in the same. Right. Same way. The common, the common, you know, they'd say Neigong usually. And I mean, that's even my teacher to this day. He doesn't use the word Qigong at all. Um, and he never has. He's, he, of course, his teacher didn't either. And, but, you know, I, it's understandable, especially if you're teaching it to Westerners, that if you run up and say, hey, this is this style has Neigong in it, they wouldn't understand. But if you say, oh, Qigong, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, you know, mm. that's, that's a bit more understood. Yeah, and Master Lam had also trained in other things with other teachers as well. Mm. So he'd done Shingi um, in Hong Kong with somebody. Right. And so he had, and he'd done Western boxing as well. He'd competed in the South Asian Martial Arts, Southeast Asian Martial Arts Tournament the year before Dan Doherty won it. Ah, okay. You know, so Dan Doherty is a, was a big Tai Chi name in Britain. Yeah, I remember. Um, and he kind of built his reputation off winning that tournament, the heavyweight division. Yeah. So I think Master Lam used to do tournaments when he was in Hong Kong, and he won the Southeast Asian Martial Arts, which was the biggest one at the time, the year before Dan Doherty. But he was in a like a lower weight class, right? Obviously, because yeah. Um, so he, the thing is that, so Dan Doherty wins it in the heavyweight division, which isn't doesn't have as many competitors because it's you know the the, the lighter weights uh, have more that's China always the case in. that's always the case yeah so but master Lam won it in the like the i say, I say using air quotes the chinese division <laughs> so he had to beat <laughs> he had to beat other kung fu students and uh, you know a lot of them 
to win it. So it was a good achievement. Yeah, basically. it is. Those days, that was quite, you know, quite uh, a big tournament back then. Quite, quite a... Yeah. He was very martial artsy back in those days, right? Uh, because it was the time of the Kung Fu boom, and he thought that this Kung Fu boom was going to go on forever. And if he could make a name for himself as a, a martial arts teacher... It was like being set up for life, right? Right. But the the kung fu boom didn't last. <laughs> it boomed and then it stopped. Did he did he um, come to the to the UK to teach specifically? Was that his goal? Specifically, yes, that was the idea. I think um, he was also like training Chinese medicine, so he opened uh, like a Chinese medicine herbal shop as well. Um, he, he had a lot of businesses going on, I think. Um, but his, I think his plan. I mean, no, no one goes, well, my plan is this. Yeah. And explains their plan to you. But I think, you know, piecing it all together, I think his plan was to try and train some Westerners in martial arts. They they win lots of tournaments, make a big name. And, you know, that leads to fame and fortune. Yeah. Um, but uh, unfortunately, the Kung Fu boom just kind of fizzled out. Yeah. And, uh, and it wasn't until 93 when MMA starts that anything in that space kind of and then it took a, a lot of years before it got popular mm. so he was like really 20 30 years out of his time there unfortunately yeah <laughs> so that didn't work but um the the other side the the, the tai chi side and the uh, you know healing side and the jam jong side was successful was taking off and he even did a tv program on channel 4 mm. in the uk which is where we only had four tv channels so it was it was a big deal. It was called Stand Still Be Fit. I remember still on this. YouTube. I think I, yeah. yeah 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 I remember this. Yeah. So that's that's Master Lamb doing that. Um Did you ever um, train with him directly? No. See before so when I met Sifu Rand, he had split off from Master Lamb not ah. in a big argument type of way. It was more in a it kind of like You've trained me up. I just need to go away and practice this stuff. Okay. Um, sort of way. They left on good terms, and they they have, I think, uh, Master Lam invited um, Sifu Ran to one of their association dinners, where he he turned up and and treated him like his sort of honoured long lost student. Oh. Um, they're very they're very they're, they're friendly. They they just they just don't. Um, I th- I think the way Sifu Ran likes to keep it is. They're, they're they're separate, right? They, uh, like his association is not he's not involved in Master Lamb's association. That's his him and his students. Okay. Um, as if around his his own association. So both are still is, teaching was, today. Yeah, I think Master Lamb was in America recently. He was in California, oh, okay. Oakland, I think, teaching over there. Oh, he's living I, there now. I think he is. Somebody I talked to on my podcast said. They had a friend who trained with him. Oh, that's interesting. In Oakland, in California, yeah. Oakland, of all places. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know. That's where Bruce Lee was teaching. Yeah, I've been there, actually. Oh. Um, I, do you remember the... That's where the Fairyland Fight Club was. I don't know if you ever remember that from Rumsoak Fist. Fairyland Fight Club? So there's a park in Oakland called the Fairyland Theme Park or something like that. And it's just a park, right? But... Uh, a group of rum soaked fist people used to meet up there and do martial arts together. Oh, okay. On a on a Sunday. Um these are people who are like this is back in the day. Um Chi Flow was one of them. Uh, um Fairyland uh, Fight Club is uh, they don't have the same rules as the other fight club, do they? Because we're no, no. Cause we're talking about I mean, it. Yeah, exactly. But they, they I think they picked the name because it's funny. Yeah. You know? Fairyland Fight Club. Um, I was over there for a, a, a conference in San Francisco and uh, Fong. You know Fong from... Yeah, I know. Um, from Soap Fist? Yeah. He picked me up in his Transformer-themed uh, Jeep, <laughs> <laughs> which has Optimus Prime on the bonnet, you know. <laughs> Why not? Drives me over the bridge to Oakland to fight these guys in a park. Uh, <laughs> It was it was hilarious. It was really fun though. We 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 put on headgear and gloves and um, Severus was the a guy for there as well. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we just had a little bit of training session together. I was thinking this is a bit dodgy because this is America, and if I injure myself, like the healthcare bills will be 
like bankrupt me for life. Yeah. <laughs> but we did it anyway, and you know it was it was all very friendly, right? Um, yeah. Well, Fong did punch me in the face really hard. No, he didn't. He he headlocked me really hard at one point. Oh, okay. And I didn't know what to do. Now you do. Which is exactly why I, I then got into jujitsu. I think because, <laughs> like now, I'd have pumped on the floor, got on top, armbar. Yeah. But it's like in it's those like, days, I had no clue what to do. And he's a big guy. Old school jujitsu big... one hundred and one. <laughs> exactly. He, he he headlocked me. He just kind of went. So what would you do if I did this? And then just headlocked me, and he was crushing my head. And I was going, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that 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 revealed the the reason for why I needed jujitsu in my life. Okay. Um, which is ironic because uh, my my teacher was actually a jujitsu teacher before mm. um, Tai Chi and everything, and he used to teach us all these self defense things. But like anything, you, you just practice them once or twice, and you don't really dwell on them because they're they're kind of not the mainstay of what you're learning off him. Was it a standing headlock? Yes. So from the side, right? Like a, like a, like a, like a school playground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The side. Oh yeah. man, the guy who does that is the guy, I mean, you now with what you know, it's like, oh, please do that to me because it's going to be exactly. the end of you. <laughs> now I'd be like giving people my head. To, please, please do that to me because then this could end really quickly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, at the time it was like, because we didn't train that kind of stuff all the time, it wasn't like the answer wasn't in my body. Right. It was, you know, um, yeah. So anyway, we've diverged again. How do we get onto? Th- how do we get onto? We were talking about uh, your teacher Lamb, and he went to the states, and then y- you mentioned. Oh yeah, sorry. Yes, I think now he's in the states, but he's not. Yeah. So my teacher is Sifu Rand, and then his teacher is Lamb. Yeah. Uh, Master Lamb. Yeah. Lamb Kam Chuan. So when you were studying with your teacher, did he teach it like today's class is Tai Chi, tomorrow's class is something else, or was it just? So he had a. Yeah. yeah so he had a like a, a syllabus. Okay. Um, every teacher does it differently, right? Mm. Um, he had a very planned out syllabus. So it was, your focus is Tai Chi. Mm. On the way through your progress, you're also going to do Choli Fat. That's but, very interesting. So you learn the Tai Chi form first. You do it to the level where you can do like the first six postural requirements. These are things like elbow sync, shoulders round, butt tucked in. Well, no, don't, don't say butt tucked in because that leads to a whole argument about whether you tuck the butt or not. But co- coccyx centered, should we just say? Right. Um, knees bent. Can you do the whole form all the way through like that? Okay, right. You're on to level two. Uh, level two, we'll start talking about continuity. So we're linking the postures together in a continuous flow. So you're going to just train that for the next like four months. Uh, that's your focus mm. in Taiji form. While you're doing that, in your spare time, here's some trolley foot, you know, and then he'll add that in because now is a good time to learn that because it's a bit more martial. Mm. They're more applicable to direct usage techniques and they don't contradict with the Tai Chi you're learning. Um, the trolley foot style we did is boxing, which mm. is a, here we go again, a softer version of trolley foot. So it doesn't use like uh, strength in the limbs tensing as much as it uses coordinated flow yeah it is a very flowing it is a very flowing style exactly so at the point you're learning the flowy stuff in tai chi that's not a bad thing to learn at the same time right right yeah and while we're doing that let's do some breakfalls okay so now we're doing breakfalls as well oh okay why you you still okay so your tai chi this is like two months down the line your tai chi is more flowy it's still you're still stopping now and again like see so you're stopping here you're stopping there it's not completely you like you you want to say 60 percent. you've got to get to 80 before you do the next thing right mm. um so here's a here's a sword form to learn while you're <laughs> okay while, you, while you're working on that's the kind of way he taught right um then we learn a shaolin sword form um which was from the shaolin lineage um, and he, Master Lam never thought Tai Chi was very good for weapons. Mm. He thought, um, that, you know, things you're meant to do slowly, weapons are not slow things. Weapons are quick things. You're better learning a Shaolin weapons form because it will, it's quick mm. and it's sharp. It's like the blade, you know? Um, so, yeah. 
So your that teacher, even madness. though it was all different things, but he had method to his madness. I mean, he, you know, he was he had exactly. a plan when and where to teach you what. He reminds me a lot of John Danaher. Okay. In jujitsu, you mean that, he, you know, that kind you, of you mean he tells you how, he talks about shrimping for forty five minutes. <laughs> no, no, he doesn't overly explain things like this is an arm. <laughs> to use an arm, you have to have a wrist. A wrist can bend this way. And it goes, oh, God, John, come on! <laughs> <laughs> I know what an arm is. <laughs> the elbow can only bend in one direction. Well done. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. No, he's not like. But I meant that he, he's a kind of a he had a an overall vision, of how to get you from beginner to like advanced well that's good and it was a it was a path yeah um and he actually would give you training notes with this all written down in okay um, and they're interesting these training notes because he eventually republished them as a book which you can buy um they're essentially like written up versions of his training syllabus mm. so it goes from beginner to advanced and it's really interesting reading them because you can only understand them as much as you've done. Okay. Like, once you read the bit beyond where you're at, the, you can you can read the words. You don't know what the hell. But is. if you stop and thought, what did I just understand from that? Nothing. But, yeah. But when you train it with him, you do it, and suddenly it all makes sense. Okay. You know, it it, it it's one of those it's, tai chi is self secret. It doesn't matter if you tell people that tricks to doing the advanced it, it, it's just words until you can until you've built on all the skills up to it it's it's uh and i've had people come up to me and go graham I, i've read your teacher's book but i i can only read so far and then i just can't understand anything else right <laughs> it's it's almost like a magic trick and then you know once you've actually done those things like his first principles are roundness mm which is moving from the center, making things round. Then it's continuity. Uh, and each of these things takes months on their own to kind of get. Um, and then after that, there was body lightness, which is... Uh, it's not a diet plan. Raise... It's not a diet plan. <laughs> I, if it was, I need it now. <laughs> <laughs> but it, was, it involved um, a bit of a Qigong technique so there's a bit of an internal technique and a bit of an external technique, which is stepping, making the stepping light. Mm. And he used to actually, I actually did this. I wore ankle weights on my ankles mm. all day. I took them off the train. I did that for about three months. I did that. And then you swap. I did that when I was around. like 19. I would wear ankle weights the whole day, but I would train in yeah. them too. And uh, So what we did was we alternated. So you, you'd wear ankle weights all day. You take them off the train, so you felt really light. Yeah. When you trained to form, and that lightness of stepping, you tried to keep that quality, right? Mm. And then after three months of that, you swap it, so you don't wear ankle weights all day. And then you wear it while you and train. You wear them to to do the form. Yeah. Yeah, and then you swap again, and then you swap again. Um, and there was a there was also a like a standing posture technique to do as well, which is to do with raising the back. Mm. He's, you know, one of the posture requirements of Tai Chi is raise the back, which kind of doesn't mean anything a lot of the time. Like, what does that really mean, raise the back? Do I, do I, do I hunch my back? What? what? That, that makes no sense. Um, but it was an internal technique. So there's a there's a point inside that you try and lift from, right? Uh -huh. um, so you combine that with the, the lightness you've got externally from the weights or not wearing yeah, the weights. Yeah. And you try and get this quality of lightness in stepping. So it's light, but you're not floating away light. You're still you're still heavy, right. if you can imagine. Right. Yeah. Anyway, it, it makes a lot more sense when you actually do it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Like anything, really. Like anything. Like anything. Yeah. But, you know, you, you hear those um, stories of lightness training, these old masters that could jump from standing, you know, over a wall and yeah. all that kind of stuff. And it's it's part of that world, you know that 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 sort of training, yeah, is, is in the Tai Chi style. Well, yeah, I mean uh, they also did lots of things like you mentioned with weights, with uh, digging pits that they would dig deeper and deeper on a you know weekly basis. Jump, out, and top, jump yeah. in, out, jump yeah. in, jump out. Yeah, it was it was mm. a progressive thing that they always did. And that's the other side of things that people don't get because a lot of the aspects we talk about that are seem to be metaphysical, 
But it seems like today people have just la- latched onto that but forgotten the other side of it, which was there's all this physical training that goes with it. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing with internal things that my teacher would always emphasize is it's never purely internal. Like mm. there's, it, there's, a, there's a physical practice and an internal practice and they go together. Right. That's how the iron palm's done. That's how yeah. body lightness is done. Whatever it is, it's never just one thing. Right, right. And if you just do one, then it doesn't work. Like if you only did the physical practice, it'll get you so, get so far. far. That's it. Yes. Only yeah, gets exactly. You if you only do the internal practice equally, you, you can never do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, your teachers, um, would you say, for example, because, you know, Choi Lei Foot's a pretty big curriculum. I mean, if you if you look at... Ah, Choi, Choi Lei Foot Hung Sing. Ah, so, yeah, it's a bigger which one. Which is the original Choi Lei Foot. It's a massive curriculum. Buck Sing was always shorter. Oh, okay. It was basically three forms. Um, they do weapons and stuff as well, but I, it's hard to know how much has been added on to it. Mm. To, to say, oh, we've also got a broadsword form we've also got a pole form like it's hard to know how much was just added in yeah from the original idea of his original idea was to slim it down mm. and make it more about sparring okay so which is what was which is a, a noble pursuit right <laughs> what was your curriculum like i mean so our, our so so the original boxing uh was three forms mm. our curriculum was one form which is a mix of the three okay now you could look at that as Master Lamb dumbed it down for Westerners to learn, mm. <laughs> um, which I, I've I've heard people say something along the idea he simplified this so that we can understand it. Um, but equally, if you've only got one form, you can practice the hell out of that. Yeah. it's quite a long form, as you'd imagine, because it's it's three things stuck together. Yeah, um, and it's got all the it's got all the basic techniques you need in it, right? And if you just practice that three times every day, you're going to get fit for one thing because it's a workout. And also it, it is a bit like drilling, you know, like when you, yeah. you know, we do drilling in jiu-jitsu where we just drill a technique over and over because you're only, you're limiting what you're practicing down. It becomes more like drilling, doesn't it? Mm. So you get, I think you get quite good at specific techniques like Sao Choi is the one that, my teacher really loved which is that sweeping, sweeping fist. fist yeah yes um i mean it, it, essentially a lot of the choi Fat techniques look like what fighters do in mma because in mma they never do clean boxing because of the dangers of takedown and kicking yeah they never get they never stand in front of each other in boxing stances and box well they, occasionally they do when they want to right if you get two guys who want to have a war and kind of put their hands up to each other and go, yeah, come on. And they just stand there and box each other. Or if you're Nate a lot Diaz. Of the time, yeah, if you're Nate Diaz. A lot of the time they're, they're punching from further out. Yeah. And the techniques visibly look more like those okay. trolley foot big arm swings. Yeah. So a lot of the techniques that we learn are long range, big swinging techniques in trolley foot. It's always... And that leopard fist is, is like a, the leopard fist is one that's really famous for. Of course. It's, it's the fist using the knuckles, right? But it's also the technique, which is to uh, blade your stance like a horse stance, bladed, and extend your arm and punch. And it's it's the most reach you can physically do as a human, I think. Yeah. So it, it, the idea is like an extra inch, an extra inch penetration. Right. And you're going for soft targets like the neck and things like that. So it's not really sporty. Um, yeah. It, yeah. So, so you've got this sort of mix of stabby leopard fist, and swinging sao choys, and gua choy, which is the back fist. That sounds like a really good advert. Come learn stabby leopard fist. <laughs> stabby leopard fist. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's always yeah, been quite it's, interesting it's, it's about nice choy foot. It's been, I mean, comparatively, when it's compared to its neighbor styles, so the styles in its environment, it was quite unique in that regard with its length. And the trajectories of its arm movements. I mean, if you compare it to a, well, what was popular in Guangzhou at the time or Guangdong, it's it's quite different. I mean, I'm sure it was. Ev- well, Wing Chun is the is the like in Hong Kong it became Choi Fu versus Wing Chun, right? Yeah. 
traditional enemies. And they, they still are. If you go to a Charlie Fett school in Hong Kong and mention Wing Chun, they're like, oh, those guys. Are. <laughs> and it, like, it's, it's, a, it's a real, it's not a real, they don't really hate each other. I was talking to um, Phil Duff in my podcast, who was, uh, he learned Charlie Fett in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, I think in the 90s or 2000s. No, maybe 2000s. Anyway, it was traditional traditional school. Mm. And they still and he, and he laughed at this this trolley foot rivalry. They still have it um with Wing Chun. But it's not they don't really hate each other. They're kind of like friends. But they're like it's almost like brothers arguing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is interesting. Um, but if you look at the styles, they're almost designed to fight each other. Well, that's like, actually I don't know, you know, I heard from and I've mentioned this in, in another podcast, but I heard from somebody that was trained a very long time ago in Hong Kong and he had quite a bit of knowledge about history of, of some of those southern styles as well and you know he was saying that actually Choi Lei Foot was deliberately created to defeat the bridges of Hunga the bridging arms of Hunga those angles mm. those trajectories even that extension mm. of the fist was to directly counter the bridging techniques of Hunga so that's quite interesting that's interesting, especially since I was talking to Phil Duffy and he's training Hungar in California, San Diego, where yeah. he lives, yeah. with a guy who is learning like a family traditional style of, or he, he holds a traditional family style of Hungar. Mm. And it's not what you thought it was at all. I thought Hungar was more like Cholly for long range no. fighting. He said it's more like stand up grappling. Really? To that degree? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Those arm bridges are little unbalances and it's not about striking it's more about um bridging and unbalancing the person and, and tripping and throwing in and then striking okay which is i was like oh that's really interesting i've never thought about that before um that could be just that particular lineage could be could be hungar but if you think that the hungar man wants to get close to you and grapple you almost yeah then wing chun with it's it's working in that that very close range, mm, isn't it? Mm. So that would make sense. Right, right. Well, you you went on to we mentioned it from your uh, fairy. What was it? Fairy, the Fairyland Fight Club. Fairyland <laughs> Fight Club encounter to to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And when did and, yeah, and one why? Of guys, one of the yeah. So one of the guys at the Fairyland Fight Club. Um, oh God, I forgot his name. Um, it'll come back to me. Um, he was. Halfway through our sort of, we did a bit of sparring, we did some push hands and everything. And him and this other guy would had these mats, and they got these mats out, and they started doing stuff on the ground, and we were kind of looking down, looking at them go, oh. and they were kind of like, oh, don't worry about that, and they just do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I was like, and then it turned out that they were doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. They just started. Ah, okay. Um, and I thought, well, oh, that's interesting, you know. Uh, Pete, ah. Pete's his name. Um, and I got talking to him and. This is like like a couple of years after. We were still talking on the internet. Um, and I said, well, just, he said, well, I'm still doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's great. I really love it. And I was thinking, oh, that's interesting. Because at, at the time, I was getting to my midlife crisis. Okay. So I'm, I'm 39. So you bought a pink, point. pink shirt. I bought a pink shirt, a Ferrari. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And I'm thinking I'm actually getting a bit uh, unfit. Um, the problem with Tai Chi is the better you get it, the less effort you have to use. Mm. So, um, and I'm, I, I'd had two kids at this point, which had really blown a hole in my, uh, like seeing my teacher at weekends. Of that's, course, that's gone, right? You know, that's no more. It's 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 twice a year at this point, right? If I'm lucky. Um, uh, I've actually at this point I've also met my. Chingy teacher, but we'll have to circle back. We'll, that. we'll circle so we'll back. Continue with, yeah, yeah. So um, I'm thinking I'm a bit. I'm a bit. I just feel unfit. I've I've got two kids. I'm having a midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> I need to do something to push myself, right? Mm. And I'm thinking everyone's talking about this Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, and there's a lot of negative reaction to it from Chinese martial artists as, oh, it's a bit gay. You know, it's <laughs> hugging on the ground. There was this sort of, you know, I'm pretty sure I probably joined in that as well. Um, 
<laughs> um, but I thought, do you know what? I'm just going to go and do it. Yeah. Uh, where I live in, in Bath, there's a guy doing lunch classes. So I don't have to take time out of looking after my kids in the evening with my wife. I could, I'm at work. I could just go off at lunchtime, do it, and come back. I thought, why not? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite open to new things. I'm not like a closed-minded person. Well, I like to think I'm not. Maybe mm. I am. Um, but I thought, I'll just give it a go. So I went down to his class. There's about four people there. There were mats. This is all new to me. They're wearing a gi. I've got a gi. <laughs> I borrow a gi. Um, the first technique he shows involves wrapping the gi around their back while your legs are around their waist and doing a choke. And this is so out of my comfort zone i've never i've never used a gi to choke anyone before i'm lying on the ground my leg why are my legs around his waist i don't understand how did we get here um but you know what i thought it was so skillfully taught and so skillfully done that i instantly saw the depth Mm. in it and i was like oh this is a whole new world and also the physical uh, require because we we did rolling, mm. you know, uh, for twenty minutes. Well, that must have killed you and, on your first day. Yeah, he actually um, halfway through he stopped and said, "Look, are you okay? Because <laughs> you're making this noise." And I was <laughs> unaware I was making. You know, like some people when they're breathing and it's it's so laboured, it sounds like they're having a heart attack. Right. So I think I was making a kind of a <laughs> sort of noise continually, but I was so like. Like, you know what it's like your first time? Yeah. I didn't even know I was doing that. Yeah. And I said, no, I'm fine. Why? He goes, well, you're making this kind of weird noise. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, so... I, I, and then, obviously, I'm wiped out for the rest of the day. Yeah. So I go back to work, and I'm sitting at my desk thinking, I can barely keep my eyes open. This is, you know... And that made me want to go back as well. Yeah. Because I thought, I've got to get... I've got to get better at this. So I... I and the next class... I rolled of a girl who choked me like six times in a row, <laughs> rear naked choke, because I had no idea about defending my back. So I just kept letting her get behind me because I had just no concept of this, mm. this idea. Uh, and that, that was a real eye opener because I was obviously much stronger than her and she defeated me six times in a row. And I was like, I have to learn this. Yeah. You know, I, I, th- there's some magic going on here that I need to know. The, <laughs> I need to know how it works. Right. So I just stuck with it, basically, um, and loved it. Uh, and it has been, it's been great. Uh, I, I I have been injured. Oh, that's normal. I've had surgery, you know, but that, you, you try to find a black belt that hasn't had surgery, it's quite tough. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, look, if you're regularly doing any martial art that has contact involved on a regular basis, you're going to get injuries. So that just comes with it, so... I mean, you, you, mm. you, if you even look at, like, if you, I don't know if you've seen some more recent interviews with Marcelo Garcia, and he's like, oh, now I'm into Pilates. I'm like, all right. Yes. <laughs> I get you. Yeah, he had, he had um, back surgery or knee surgery, didn't he, yeah. recently? Yeah. So, you know, we kind of overlook these things, but, you know, one side is doing stuff to keep you injury free, or you could just avoid the activity completely, but it's not like you're going to do that. So, you know, you just try and mitigate the damage you're doing to your body by doing prehab and other mobility stuff and uh, mm. keeping yourself, you know, just in good shape in between sessions. So you don't, you don't, you, you mitigate the risk of injury. But injury is always a, a risk. Yeah. It's always going to be a risk. Yeah, but the, the better you get at it, the more you can lessen that risk because Completely. you're more experienced it's the beginners that are danger to themselves and others in jiu-jitsu isn't it yeah that's why it's called the angry white belt club so <laughs> yeah it's like the fairyland fight club but full of angry white belts <laughs> <laughs> and it carries on yeah. i would say until i don't know i mean blue belts are still they can still be a bit a bit uh excessive Exciting. as well yeah <laughs> so. yeah so how long did you do have you been doing jiu-jitsu for brazilian jiu-jitsu yeah, so I started when I was 39 and I'm 51 now. Okay, so, so just a little bit of time. Years. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you... But yeah, I'm still going. So I, t- I teach now. I, I teach three classes a week Okay. Um, in the mornings, which I, I love. Uh, so, you know, jiu-jitsu becomes about that getting the blue belt. Mm. Once you get the blue belt, it's like 
well now what's my goal okay I've got to think about purple yeah and on it goes until you get eventually you get black and then you kind of think well what's my goal now and then your goal becomes teaching people mm. I think mm. um, so I really enjoy teaching people I've got like a a group of regulars that come in the mornings good so like I kind of think of them as like my guys um, and I try and make them better <laughs> and and you 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 trained at Gracie Baja the whole time yeah, same with my with the same teacher the whole time, all the way from white to black. Okay, that's good. I mean, at least my professor is uh, Salvatore Pace. Mm. He's Italian from Sicily. Okay, and lives in Britain. Um, so his his jiu jitsu always had that Italian flair. <laughs> I don't know, you know, you know how it, it, Italian people generally have a kind of they're, they're more sort of sophisticated mm. and uh, uh, I don't know. There's just something like you know. Ferraris are Italian, right? I thought you were going to say his jiu-jitsu is like lasagna. It's got lots of layers to it. <laughs> well, it's heavy. <laughs> lasagna is... I mean, I've, I've, I've met a lot of jiu-jitsu people now over those 11 years. Yeah, right? of course. I've been to seminars with like, you know, famous people mm. and stuff. Nobody has ever exerted the pressure on me that my teacher does. Oh, really? Like, from side control. He, he is like a truck. And that was the, one of the first things that really struck me about his jiu-jitsu was the weight he put on you. I mean, what, if you're a white belt, a beginner, yeah. he puts you in side control, you tap. It's, it's horrible. You can't breathe. Um, over time, you toughen up, right? And then you, you don't have to just tap because you're in side control. You know how to but, alleviate it a bit. Yeah, yeah. You, you, I think you just toughen up, don't you, in jiu-jitsu? Yeah. Like, uh, like the first year or two years jiu-jitsu i was so stiff all the time that i could i could barely like squat down mm. um and just over time naturally your body just toughens up i think it's like a jiu-jitsu iron body approach isn't it yeah well it's going to change yeah. you completely i mean any practice is going to do that over time your body's just going to change so yeah but he's got this phenomenal top pressure so he's more of a, a heavy pressure kind of guy right so well he's a bit of everything oh is he's he He's got he's incredibly flexible hips. He can do the splits and stuff. So his guard is like a nightmare to, you know. He lies on his back and just sort of opens his legs, and you think, oh, see, this oh, is why I, those I those I kung, around you. This is why those kung fu people say it's gay. If you just took that sentence right, <laughs> <up there. laughs> yeah, but um, yeah. So he, he, oh, he's a he's a nightmare from every position. Hmm. There's, 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 there's no. There's, that's that's worse as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's also that also works. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't you can't not say things that have innuendos in jiu-jitsu at all. Can you? Would you say that your jiu-jitsu training has given you different perspectives on everything else that you've practiced? Oh, definitely. Mm. Um, like when I do my tai chi form now, uh, I'm seeing grappling applications to everything mm. that I wouldn't have seen before. Right. Like repulse monkey arm drag. Right. Yeah. Uh, before I'd have thought it was some sort of wrist grab and then a strike and now I think it's an arm drag it's obviously an arm drag you know mm. um, so I think you can do that without I think Tai Chi is flexible in that in that way like you, there were, I don't think there's meant to be particular applications to techniques sometimes it's more of a principle um, well there's a lot of potentials Exactly. There's a lot of potential. So I, you know, there's a lot of potential examples. You know that uh, the character for what they call for posture, which is shi, uh, like santi shi. You know that shi mm. character. And when you sure. talk about like uh, um, tai chi, they'll say x amount twenty four posture. Er si si shi. That traditional character shi also means has the meaning of potential. So you know, for me, it's a it's a much more accurate. Um, meaning of the word i don't like the word posture i prefer the idea of uh you know um potential in in most of these yeah, things that's interesting so yeah i i do now you've said it um i wasn't aware of that so you've you've taught me something oh ah, good yeah so yeah i mean and that's what i think that's why the whole debate about no kung fu is all grappling no i mean it can be there can be a lot of grappling in there. It can also be not, oh, and, you know. That's that YouTube video, isn't it, that we watched recently? Right, right, uh, right. It's just called Kung Fu is 90% Grappling. Yeah, yeah. Just clickbaity headline. Exactly, exactly. I, I felt sorry for the guy in it, though, that Jacob guy. Yeah, because he's, come out, like... he's come out and explained what he actually meant, and it seems like, you know. Yeah, yeah So I think the other guy ambushed him, didn't he? Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. 
and put him on YouTube with a clickbaity headline that he wasn't expecting. But that, I mean, come on, let's look. If you go to that guy's channel, that's all just clickbaity crap. So, I, I, yeah. no offense to people to like him. For me personally, I just don't like. I don't like what he presents. So, you know, that's just that's just my opinion on it. But yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I guess he's trying to make a living out of it, isn't he? Or, you know, I I don't. I, it's almost like the Jake Mace thing, isn't it? Mm. Like, I I don't mind these guys making a living. Um, I don't want to say, oh, you, 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 but the way they present it, it just creates such confusion and and a bad impression of these arts mm. sometimes. Um, it's tough. Well, it's tough, they're, like, they're not making those videos for people like you or me or people that are in the martial arts, like Chinese, even Chinese martial arts for a few years. They're making it for your, you know, um, average person you know or people exactly. that are just getting into martial arts so so why should we care in a way but you know it's just it's pain they're painful to watch well, aren't they that's the problem well it's it's kind of <laughs> like i mean i don't know in your martial arts path i used to love buying and we're coming back to your your career actually you, you're working in magazines i used to love buying martial arts magazines when i was you know in my yeah, younger days i used to collect whatever inside kung fu black belt magazine but let's leave it at inside kung fu and those chinese martial arts magazines i can't read those now it's just superficial if i go back and look at it for the most part it's it's superficial mm -hmm. and i guess it's a very similar type of uh you know substance with a lot of these youtube videos today so it's, it's that demographic i compare it to something like a, a journal on chinese martial studies or something like that it's if I if I gave that to a person who's not deep in the arts, he's going to fall asleep. He's going to be bored to death. But exactly, yeah. yeah you've got an article in Inside Kung Fu that says six leopard style strikes to kill your opponent. They're like, ooh, you know. Meanwhile, you know, it's 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 serving a different purpose. That's that's basically that. So, yeah. You know, we had a discussion a while ago, just privately, you and I. Um, and a little bit in public, uh, but we were discussing the idea or the concept. Um, and we still need to come back to your Shingen teacher, so we'll still come back to that. Just remind me about that. But we were discussing okay. the topic of style versus format, I don't know if you remember yes. that. So, yeah, yeah what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, what, how... So my first thought... Yeah, go on. My first thought is that you're a, you're a qualified wushu judge who judges things on stylistic points. So... If I want to get into this conversation with anyone and win the argument, you're probably the like my worst opponent, right? Because <laughs> you're you're completely qualified uh, to judge what is the style and isn't the style, mm. you know, like officially. Right. Um, I think my point really was that um, rules make styles, right? Mm. So if you change the rule set, you could invent a new style. So if we had. Um, for example, a rule that you are only allowed to kick with your left leg, mm -hmm. right? And and something else, right? Something else random. So you can only kick with your left leg and your left hand, say, right? Um, and we then trained a martial art using that rule where you could only kick with your left leg and use your left hand. Mm. The techniques that would come out of that would be unique to that and it would eventually become a style but it was started off as a rule mm. right so rule sets make style so if mma has a rule set then i think it can create a style because it doesn't have a like its own lineage and history mm. like a lot of traditional styles do so whether you count that as a defining thing is it matters i think but if you don't count that as a defining thing um techniques would come out of the mma rule set which i'll give you an example of that yeah um grappling on the cage on the cage wall itself right that is a thing now getting your opponent to the cage wall um and like fence yeah they call it i think they call it the fence don't they fence grappling grappling them down to the floor from the fence yeah. requires specific techniques that you can't do out in the open, right? And then controlling somebody when they're against the fence, like Khabib does, yeah. where he sits on that leg, they're, they're, the opponent's sitting up, 
could be almost lies on grape vines the body and, lock. Yeah. Grape vines the leg, sits on it, and every time they try and get up, he just brings them back to the map. Right, pulls that returning the opponent to the map from the fence. Yeah. That that is a unique thing that you find in MMA and it's not taught anywhere else. Mm. Um I think a lot of MMA coaches still don't actually teach it, which is a mistake. So I think it I think those are that's an area of MMA where new techniques exist that you won't find anywhere else right. I mean, if you and if you're not learning those specific techniques against the fence then you're at a huge disadvantage to your opponent when they get you there yeah well for me the idea i mean you, I, I don't disagree with that but i think that um those people that are training specifically to compete in a format will train in the most effective method to compete in that format and mm -hmm. if it stays crystallized for a while then that could be considered a style per se. But the issue here lies in somebody who comes in and does something completely outside of that box. As long as it's within the rule sets legal, it, it, can, it can fit. So for me, MMA is more like a format. But the natural conclusion that most people will come to is, okay, what's the best techniques in this format? And that's how we're going to train our curriculum. The other problem is the second they change a rule, then you have to change your your training to match yeah. whatever's been changed. And for me, that's a... Which you see in that's the, judo a lot, don't Exactly. You? And that's the opposite of a style, per se, because uh, when you're looking at a specific style, it's supposed to conform to something... And we're talking about classical concepts of style. Uh, conform mm -hmm. to something outside of any, any specific situation. It's supposed to be just, you know... Uh, what's, what's the idea? It's supposed to be as it is continuously going on and not meant specifically for a single situation so i guess we're saying the same so, thing so are you saying that a style has to like exist in perpetuity it is it is formed at some point in time and continues on exactly like that for the rest of time no i mean styles do change and 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 uh you know evolve but again w w then we'd have to substantiate what we mean by style so um if you want to say, is this classical X, Y, and Z? Well, then it's got to conform to classical X, Y, and Z's uh, initial idea. If we're saying, yes, it came from that, but it's evolved. That's also okay. Somebody can change it. But it's not necessarily going to be what the general people would consider the original style anymore. It'll be something else. So, so would you call what they do in Olympic judo, would you say that was not classical judo? Or would you say it is classical judo? I would say it isn't. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the that comes back to your point because they've changed the way they're training because of the rules. So, the rule set. Yeah. So, but it's still judo, isn't it? I mean, yeah. what, what do you call it? But I would say judo... You call it Olympic judo, I guess. Yeah, the <laughs> issue here is that judo originally was a divergence. That's why the name was changed, you know? Um, it wasn't mm. called jujitsu, so he called it something else because it was a divergence. So, who decides how far it can diverge? I don't know that answer to that question. But I would say that MMA, in that sense, is a is a. Although people train it in a specific way today, for me, it's still a format because you do have the ability to do things that aren't common as long as they conform to the rules. And what usually happens is you'll get somebody come in and do something new. And if he's successful with it, boom, everybody starts doing that. So uh, you just mentioned the, the cage fight on the cage wrestling, cage grappling, um, mm. fence ground. I don't know what they call it. That was something that was seen by certain people, you know, and then people are like, oh, that's really good. Let's go deeper into that. You know, you're the oblique kick that became popular more recently, uh, which wasn't done maybe even 15 years ago. It wasn't as common. So it's a format. I would still call MMA a format as a competition event. How people... The other, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, the other way people talk about styles is, is, is language, right? Yeah. So there's an argument to be made for if people talk about things in the common vernacular a certain way, then that is, you know, that's enough to go in the dictionary. Mm-hmm. Um, like new words are added to the dictionary all the time and if we talk about MMA like it's a style then it, it kind of becomes a style yeah. so people would say what are you doing tonight I'm going to train MMA like the way they would say I'm going to do judo yeah, that's true. or I'm going to do 
karate. Yeah. They wouldn't say, I'm going to do a format called MMA, <laughs> which, which, in which I might use the usual techniques. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I do take your point about the you're free to, within the, the, the rules of MMA, you're free to do whatever the hell you like, aren't you? Yeah. Because um, it's a very open style. Uh, like it's a very non-restrictive rule set a lot like judo has a much more restrictive rule set exactly like majorly restrictive um, jiu-jitsu has a less restrictive rule set than judo mm. but compared to MMA it's still incredibly restrictive correct you can't punch people well, for example. well even more than that I mean if you had to just take these different uh because these are competitive events that we're talking about specifically. So we're not talking about the individual training of, this, of the arts, but the competitive aspect of the training of the, of the arts. So randori in judo, rolling in jiu-jitsu, wrestling. Let's talk about freestyle wrestling, etc. If you just put them all out onto like some sort of a chart, they're combat formats. But if you want to put them on a gauge between very restrictive to... Uh, least restrictive i mean you could plot these things out on there and like like you said okay um combat methods that are allowed uh, is throwing allowed yes is is uh joint locks manipulations and strangles allowed yes is striking allowed no oh okay so that's this it falls on the spectrum here if you've got something that allows all of that but then you can also use striking but you can't use knees or elbows then it's slightly rest less restrictive but then you've got the other aspect of of the attire too because what's restrictive about judo the gi that is a part of the restriction i can't come onto the judo mat without a gi right so mm -hmm. that that's part of a restrictive format so but like likewise today in mma you can't walk into the cage with a gi on so how you determine what's restrictive or not takes a lot of discussion right and 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 to talk about yeah an evolution over time because you know very well i mean you just mentioned it your day one thing that you learned in jujitsu was a, a lapel choke basically right over the back of the guy and you do a cross choke with his lapel if i understood you yeah. correctly yeah so yeah and it was it was complicated it was was the point i was trying to make was it was incredibly technical mm. <laughs> for a day one um this is this was like back in when was this 20, 2011 mm. Like these days, when you go to a new jiu-jitsu class, you get taught something easier, I think. Mm. Um, things have moved on, you know. They're, they're much more welcome beginners, you know. You're not thrown in the deep end quite so much. <laughs> yeah, in general, it should be like that. Usually, they've even got it separated into beginner's classes and then more advanced classes so for that specific reason. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah, but I mean, there there you could say again that the, the, the gi becomes a weapon for some of these people, right? So... So yeah. for them having the, the gi is a weapon, yeah definitely. exactly so for them having a gi on is actually an advantage, right? So is it restrictive? You know, I, it's very, it's very different. Maybe yeah. I I don't think having a gi on against someone who doesn't is ever an advantage. Though. I don't know what um, Hoist Gracie was thinking when he went into the MA cage wearing a gi. <laughs> well, he did use it. I recall. I think in UFC one on one of the guys he. I, I think he did. You're right. Yeah. He lapel. He did an Ezekiel or something. He did an Ezekiel. Yeah. I think so. There you go. I mean, he yeah. he did use it. He did use it. But it was. But if those guys he was fighting had any experience, well, it's a different heat, story. They would have known that all they have to do is grab it and you can yank the guy around <laughs> yeah and he can't stop you <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know i i think guys like uh, you know that generation of of jiu-jitsu guys as well the the gracie the first generation guys that came into the states they had they were pretty street tough uh, so they knew if they were putting a jacket on that uh, they were they were going to make use of it even if you started grabbing the grabbing it and pulling on it they they were going to yeah, end up turning it around didn't know what to do with someone in a jacket, yeah. did they? That was the thing. These days, you know, you'd be you'd be in all sorts of trouble. I think also it was sending him. It was it was a visual message, wasn't it? They were deliberately doing that. Jiu-jitsu is superior. Yeah. Look, I'm wearing a gi. You know, it was it was all um, PR and propaganda, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was deliberate. So, which they were great at, you know, but like, I mean, those those guys had have been. Um, propagandering jiu-jitsu since the 19 like 30s in Brazil. Oh yeah. They had a lot of experience of doing that, you know. There's, there's an old TV advert with for jiu-jitsu, a black and white one. Mm. And it's um it's a guy on the beach in Rio with his girlfriend and then, then a big muscly guy comes up and kicks sand in his face and steals the girl and then he goes and learns jiu-jitsu and uh, comes back. And next time the guy comes up he just hip throws him and 
takes the gun on his arm and walks off all happy. I think I've seen this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, they, 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 they were starting the, the PR campaign for jiu-jitsu a long time ago, you know. Have you read uh, Robert Drysdale's book, Opening Close Guard? Uh, no, I haven't read it yet. Um, I'd like to at some point. Yeah. I... Uh, I've, watched the, I've watched the interviews where he talks about everything in it. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I I bought the book when it I, when it first got released, so I've read it. Yeah, it's an interesting read. There's a lot of stuff in there, but of course, there's a whole section of uh, there's a whole bunch of people that have written uh, stuff that are based on a whole lot of archival, st- and it just makes you want to read all of that stuff, and then you're going into the the thousands of pages. But yeah, it was there was a lot of propaganda. There's a lot of history there that people don't know. So yeah, mm. very interesting, very interesting rivalries. Right. Um. With other other jiu-jitsu teachers and the lucha livre stuff. Right, right. I mean, I need, I need the family as well. You know, they they had they were already having bus stops within the family. Oh, totally. So it was a huge family. Totally. Very interesting family, to be honest. I mean, my impression, and again, we're go, we're going into jiu-jitsu, but my conclusion was the following, and and people can disagree with me if they want to. The stubbornness uh, of Elio Gracie. Uh, carrying on from his 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 brother but helio himself the stubborn brashness is the only reason why jiu-jitsu didn't become judo and get absorbed by judo and then kind of just fade into to the what 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 judo is today it's purely because of his stubborn attitude he was a stubborn sob a brash stubborn you a man's man, wasn't he? Well, yeah, but he. I mean, I don't know if you could just say it was. I mean, people might say yes, it's because he really wanted to keep the effectiveness. Yeah, probably it had part of to do with it, you know. But he probably also was looking at it from a business he point of view. Probably didn't want people telling him what to do. Yeah, that I mean, too. You know, it's that sort of macho thing of like, you're not going to come over here from Japan and tell me what to do. Yeah. So you, you want you want to beat me? You get on the mat and try. Yeah, exactly, you know? exactly. So there's that. But anyway, you should read the book. Yeah, it's an interesting history. It's an interesting, yeah, I will do it at some point. Interesting. All right, I wanted to. T- I know we're running a bit long. I don't know how much time you have, but your Shingi training. We you mentioned it. We said we'd circle back. Oh yeah. So, um, yeah. So, two thousand and one. I started because. Um, so let's just backtrack. Master Lam had learned Shingi. Yeah. He didn't teach Shingi to Sifu Rand, but what he did was he used the ideas from Shingi to get them into sparring quicker mm. um so he would particularly use the animals from shingi as kind of coat hangers for technique mm. so he'd look at the person the student and go okay physically i think this animal would work for you mm. here's some like horse and he'd go right so horse goes like this ba 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 and then you do like a stepping pattern and some punches so he's, they're not learning shingi from the ground up they're just using the idea of that animal okay right? so they're not expected to be doing perfect shingi he just wanted to get people fighting quickly so he went for your physical shape and your mind i think these techniques would work and he just show him some horse techniques right and they go okay and for you you're sort of rounder and shorter and squatter and muscly bear would be good for mm. you okay hit bear goes like this but but i need to just kind of you know do a little walk and a, a few steps and some technique and then, okay right try and do that in sparring together and then off they go and they so they were given like an animal mm. to work with um so as you can see that that is no way learning shingi yeah that is learning using the idea of from shingi right um kind of in a practical way so i'd always had this flavor or a bit of shingi from that sort of teaching in my Tai Chi um, and Choi Fuck stuff. He'd use animals from Shaolin as well, so he wouldn't restrict it to Shingi. He'd use crane and and stuff as well. So, and leopard. Yeah. Um, but I'd always had that idea of animals and fighting patterns and styles. I'd always been interested in Shingi. Um, I eventually managed to bump into this guy on a discussion forum and we got talking about something unrelated. It was about Tai Chi. But I thought, oh, this guy is actually really, he knows a lot about this stuff. Mm. And then it turned out, and he goes, well, actually, I'm a Shingi practitioner, not a Tai Chi practitioner, really. I do a bit of Tai Chi, but it's not my first art. My first art Shingi. Mm. And I was like, oh, that's rare. 
especially in Britain. Um, and it meant we actually ended up meeting up. Um, he just came around my house because he was he travel around the he seemed to travel around the country huge distances. He lived up in um, near Leeds, which is north mm-hmm. England. I live in this near, near Bristol, which is in the south. Um, but he seemed to be working like just down the road, uh, but then driving home for like five hours, <laughs> and then the next day driving five hours. And I, I it just seemed the most bizarre concept. He, and he would sleep and he'd drive five hours, sleep two hours in the car, and then go to work. Wow, um, I know, in, insane, insane lifestyle, um, and so he just popped round, and we went to the park, and he, 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 the first thing he ever does when if he's if he's gonna teach you shingi, is he hits you a bung shuan, just to see what you do, because <laughs> some people freak the hell out, and can't, and like you know, it's because it's he just goes bop, and it it, it feels like. It feels like his fist has gone through your body, mm. and out, and it goes it goes inside, and you. I think I probably just collapsed to the floor, going. <laughs> and a lot of people at that point want nothing more to do with him. Well, that's probably why he was driving around so much. He was on the run. <laughs> <laughs> he was on the run. <laughs> but um, but that that was the interview process. Is basically he ends up giving you a taste of what he called dark jing, mm. dark jing. Um, so there's bright jing and dark jing. The Shanxi stars tend to specialise in what he would call bright jing. They don't call it bright jing, but he call, he seems to call it, which is more like um, tai chi, like fa jing, okay. uh, sort of explosive and quick. Whereas his hebei, or hebei, yeah, sorry, my pronunciation is terrible. Um, it's all right. His hebei, <laughs> just don't hold it against me. Uh, his hebei is more about weight and mass mm. going through you so he's not going to speci- specialize in doing the sort of quick explosive movements it's more like right uh, through and so he always he, he, if he's gonna if you're a prospective student he's gonna hit you with that because it's unlike a normal punch to me mm. anyway it it feels like you've been gone through with a spear you and then some people freak out in response and get angry or like what the hell do you oh, why'd you do that to me like um they don't like it or they've been doing tai chi which involves no contact whatsoever yeah. for 10 years and suddenly they're not used to being hit and they freak out a little bit um i was like that's really good show me how you did that <laughs> let me, and he was let, like, okay hang on let me pick up we can let me pick up my teeth but show me how, how, how you did that yeah exactly yeah let me yeah, well, I'm lucky he didn't hit me in the teeth. Yeah. He has hit me in the teeth before as well, and he got me right in the teeth as well with a knuckle. I was like, "Oh my god, that really hurts." <laughs> I had a friend who 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 uh, I'm not going to say what happened, but long story short, we ended up okay. So after a fight with some anyway, um, and he had a bone sticking out of his knuckle, and he kept Ooh. he kept on pushing the bone back in for like the next day, and then eventually we found out it wasn't a bone; it was somebody's tooth. <laughs> Oh no! Oh, that's revolting. Yeah, and he was trying to push it back in. Back in, yeah. So yeah, carry on with your 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 tooth story. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, so I I I then kind of became his student, and uh, as he was doing these massive long trips around the country, quite often dropping like it became once a week, hmm. and for once a week, we kept this going for quite a few months, and eventually I I kind of felt like it was. His depth of knowledge was so great that it was almost intimidating trying to learn off him mm. um, because he had an extensive system of Shingi. So obviously you have the five elements just like every other style of Shingi yeah. does. Um, but his speciality was in the animals and he had um, he had this he had three, he'd learned from three Chinese teachers mm. um, who had been, who had been teaching in universities in Britain and he tracked them down almost and basically followed them around for years all the time in Britain learning off them in Britain yeah so they were Chinese nationals but they were teaching at universities in Britain on exchange programs okay. right he managed to get three of these genuine type Chinese sorry two of these genuine Chinese teachers um, yeah sorry the third one he actually went to Beijing the, the two were in Britain right mm. Um, the first one 
had taught a family style which was very unconventional and came from Malaysia. Mm. So a Shingi that had gone to Malaysia then come to him and then got to Britain. Um, the second one was much more traditional uh, Goshu style. So it's quite stylistic mm. and minimal. Um, so the first system was huge and expansive. The second system was much more like like the, the, like a horse link would be three moves. Yeah. Uh, and a swallow would be like this this two moves or three moves mm. like it, they're not very big um and then he both these guys were really good and then he had the chance to go and work in china set up a business in china so he'd gone to china for a few years and he'd gone around bookshops and things trying to look for trying to find a a better shingi teacher right even though those two were more than he could have ever hoped for coming from Britain. Um, and eventually he managed to get an argument over this obscure Chinese book in a bookshop with this guy about who... They both tried to buy it at the same time. <laughs> he eventually... And then eventually he, he, he thought, well, why do you want this book? Because this is a really obscure martial arts book. And then he got in a conversation. He had a translator with him. and He couldn't speak Chinese particularly well at that time. So he had a translator with him. And... Um, they got in this conversation. He said, well, my teacher teaches in this park every, whenever, every morning mm. or every evening. I think it was evenings, actually, at this time. I said, well, yeah, come along. And then eventually, so he, he turned up and uh, and it turned out that this teacher, he had like two students, maybe, mm. like not very many at all. And it turned out he was phenomenal. And he was the like the, the best guy. Mm. Um and he got taken on as a student by him. Um, he also taught in Badji as well. Oh, okay. He, um, and this this guy was unknown to the. He, he worked in a factory all day in northern Beijing back in the eighties. Yeah. Or nineties, nineties maybe. Like a grim industrial factory, and then taught in this park in the evening. Um, no other foreign students at all. Yeah. It was you know. Uh, and he learnt off him, and he said he was phenomenal. Now he didn't necessarily. He said what was weird was that he didn't teach him new stuff. He just said, "Show me what you can do, mm. and I'll improve it." He refined. So he it. showed the content. He yeah, refine it. So he showed the content he had from his first two teachers, and his third teacher just refined everything. Right. So that's the style that I got taught was in the style of the third teacher, but the content of the first two. I see. But they're all Hubei lines, right, right? Right. So they all essentially come from Goyin Shen yeah. in some way. Mm. Well, it traces uh, back for sure. I mean, if it's Hubei. Yeah, you could trace them all back yeah. to him. But obviously, they've all come through different people. Um, but it's all in this in the style of this last this last teacher. Um, and it it does look a bit different to like your style of Chingi, mm. but everyone's style of Chingi seems to look a bit different mm. to each other's. Mm. Um, I was watching your Santi Shi Santi Shi sure, yeah. video uh, that you did, and I actually stood along with you um, this morning. Well, the timer the video. <laughs> the timer video. Oh, good. I think it's quite nice to stand with somebody. It well, feels a bit like you're part of a group. Well, that's why it? I did it. It's for people that don't have anybody to to stand with. You could just stand. Not, not no excuse. You have something to stand with. Just go stand. It's easier, yeah. I think, than just doing it on your own against a clock. Yeah. 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 I. I anyway. Um, how people cannot realise that is beyond me. <laughs> <laughs> how they have to get upset about it. Oh, well, I don't stand the way you're standing, therefore it's useless to me. Well, you don't have to. You also don't have, you don't have to. You, you don't <laughs> yeah. have to wear the clothes I'm wearing in the video either. I mean... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, you know, our, our Santi shirt is a different version to yours. Yeah. We, we, we emphasise more bare shoulders. So the, the back elbow, rather, you, you hold it tight to your hip. We actually open that out, okay. so it makes the shoulders round. Right. You know, it's just a different emphasis. It's just, it's all the same stuff, really. It's right. Just, you know, you never with so many different teachers of an art, it's impossible for it always to be the same way, and I, and it would be really boring if it was. I think as well. Yeah. So, um, he, as well as being a as doing all this stuff in, Shingi, he he's, an expert. In various other martial arts, Japanese ones, Kempo. Okay. Um, 
which are huge systems. Those are huge, huge systems. So his, his Shingi system is huge. His Kempo is is huge, and that's just two of the things he does. You know, he it, it's he's an unusual person, like a polymath, I'd say, mm. uh, where he seems to be like the way Isaac Newton was a, an expert in so many fields. We just know him for physics, right? Yeah. But he was brilliant at everything. Um, it's a bit like Damon is kind of like an expert in all sorts of martial arts. Um, he's really good at badgy, mm. like really good. Um, and his Tai Chi is phenomenal as well, you know. Um, well, I think, he just doesn't I think if you've got the basic, you know, if you learn good body mechanics, whatever, like what we tried to develop in Xing Yi Quan, I think that carries across well to anything really uh so you know I, mm. I think that's that's one of the values of of having a principle-based art you know so yeah yeah one of the things that his other real passion is and i'm going to use the word shamanism now mm. which instantly everyone goes oh my god that hippie nonsense <laughs> no like real real shamanism that's his real passion and i think it affects it, it, it sort of influences everything he does. Um, particularly, like, Shingi, is, you know, it's got these animals in it. Uh, shamanism has a lot to do with animals, mm. got a lot to do with the natural world. And it's... When I look back at learning with him, it was like he was teaching me Shingi, but at the same time, he was really teaching me shamanism. Mm -hmm. He just never said he was. <laughs> but you guys, you guys have a podcast. You've done a whole bunch of podcasts together on yeah. on the topic, right? Yeah. So he he does um, a couple of podcasts. One of the Woven Energy podcasts with his friend or student Joe. Oh, okay. Joe and and that is a shamanism podcast. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where they teach you shamanism. Okay. Like, there's 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 seven stages, and they go from stage one, and the idea I think they're on four now. And it's taken five years to get to four, right? Jeez. So it's a long process. Yeah. <laughs> don't don't expect a quick fit. It's not like you're going to bang a drum and fall down a hole and go off on a trance in your first lesson. No, mm. it's 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 as grueling as martial arts, right? It it you need as much effort as you would take in learning shingi to learn this stuff. Right. It's physical hard work. Um, they so they. It started on stage one, and they, he also does a podcast with me, which is called the Heretics Podcast. Yeah. Now that, now that kind of, it, it's related to the shamanism because the, it, it, the one of the first things about shamanism is it's, it goes back to when we were hunter gatherers, mm. right? Before we lived in societies and cities and stuff like that, where it was a tribe. So as we as human beings moved into. Um, living collectively in cities with rulers and kings who told us what to do we kind of lost something and the way they the, the, and, we, and we we traded a bit of comfort for a, a, a bit of a bit of being controlled by other people mm. and one of the ways they control us is with this thing that Damon calls the miasma which is like unspoken cultural assumptions um, and I think it's particularly strong in somewhere like China, mm. uh, like you're saying with that, when people were telling you uh, not to go into your own building right. and stuff, right? like ath authority control. And the easiest way is to get, rather than having to have an army to impose it on people, the easiest way is to get them to impose it on each other. Well, exactly. So that is part of what David calls a miasma. Um now the Heretics podcast is to is a podcast about history, but looking at it through the kind of the lens of, of the the miasma because every time you you go against the miasma you're called a heretic right, mm. that's why it's called heretics because it, it's people, over in in history people who are heretics were going against the prevailing, view right right, and they got burned at the stake in religions you you tended to get burned at the stake if you were protestant at the wrong time when everyone else was catholic or if you were catholic at the time everyone else was protestant yeah um yeah well it's interesting days, that you say that it's like an unspoken you... kind of thing and it's kind of automatic because you know yeah. china i don't know if you guys know but china has implemented this like travel not travel this health uh, app on your phone and your life is basically controlled by it 
we have to have PCR right. tests with at least every 40, 72 hours. Otherwise, the thing changes color and then you can't go anywhere. Um, and then every place you're going into, you have to scan with your app. And then, you know, they, they people look at it and you, you get... Anyway, and interestingly, when I was coming back into my, my residential area here, this guy stops me and says, scan. And I'm like, I, I, I showed him my residence card for the building. I said, I live here. It doesn't matter. Scan. And I just looked at the guy yeah. and I said, and if I scan and there's a problem, what happens then? What happens <laughs> then? I live on the street out here with you. And he's like, no, 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 you can go home. I said, so what the hell and why are you doing it? Just ask yourself this question. Mm. And, and this is where this is where that that mentality comes in. Like when I asked this question, he's like, no, no, I don't need to think why I've just been told to do that. I'm like, yeah, but just sit back and ask yourself why you're doing this and what, if there's logic behind what you're doing, you know. I understand an outsider, but why? If you're not going to stop me, even if there's a problem with this thing, then what the hell are we doing, you know? <laughs> so, mm. but it's exactly what you were saying. It's it's like kind of this. It's a, it's a lot easier to control people if they can if they self-regulate. Yeah, you know? yeah. It, 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 otherwise, you have to exert a lot of effort. Right. The elites in power have to exert a lot of effort to control people. But if they do it themselves, unconsciously, without even thinking, yeah. then then great, you know. Um, but so, the, yeah, so the Heritage Podcast goes back through history and looks at historical things. Well, we've done a lot of martial arts, actually. You have. Everything has a miasma. Martial arts has a miasma. Right. Like, jiu-jitsu has a miasma. Like, um, we train self-defense, but we do it without shoes on, on a mat that's nice and soft. In a gi. Like, in a gi. <laughs> like, if you stop and think about it, go, no. That, that, if reality if reality confronted us, that's not reality, is it, right? So, the thing is, reality always, reality or nature, same thing, always, when that hits the miasma, reality always wins, mm. right? <laughs> yeah. It's like those people in Tai Chi who think they can move people without touching them using chi. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. When they try it in 2022, we're, the MMA st- we're still having this conversation <laughs> in 2022. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. We're still having that on Rumsfeld Fix. We're still having that conversation. Um, but the problem is they run into reality, right? And then reality hits them in the face quite literally um, when, when you think you can move people without touching them, mm. right? Um, and that is basically the imagine of being exposed to reality. Yeah, very true. And that guy who. Like you said, that guy who was trying to check your card, your code, whatever, scan you. Like, if it had registered as, you know, not allowed, the reality is that he probably couldn't do anything to you, you know? Yeah. It's, it's not like he suddenly has some real authority over you. He has imaginary authority over you. Exactly. Yeah, uh, you know, for me, it, the the reason why I just asked him that is wasn't that I didn't feel like scanning. And the, the question was, do you are you just doing something without knowing why you're doing? It? I mean, I can't understand if you're a kid, uh, that's fine. But if you're a fully grown adult, you should be like, uh, why am I doing this? <laughs> How is this serving any purpose? You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, the, the miasma does serve a purpose in modern life. Like, if your mum tells you not to touch the hot stove because you'll get burned, you you believe her, right? Yeah. Like. Because you know, it's useful. <laughs> Being told to do things sometimes is useful. You know, like we have to have, so we all have some of it, basically. Right. But shamanism as a process is about getting rid of it, and just trying to take in the natural world as it is, unfiltered. And that is hard work because you're conditioned. But I'm gonna flip this on you. Yeah. Go on. By saying there are certain methods and processes, doesn't shamanism itself has a mi- have a miasma that you've just referred to? Yes, of course, everything has a miasma. You yeah. cannot get away from it. Everything in modern life, because we are not hunter-gatherers living in a tribe, everything has some sort of miasma. We're not, we are not having to confront, confront nature on a daily basis. Um, so even our practice of shamanism has a miasma. And what it has is that image of hippies banging a drum dancing around a fire hmm. going on a spirit journey and do you know what i mean like, yeah a lot of people who want to get into shamans and want that right you know but that's not what it is <laughs> um so yeah so that's what damon's real interest is in is that but you, you can 
Because it's to do with reality, right? What's real? Martial arts is a great way to learn it. Because if you're delusional in martial arts, you tend to end up becoming a cropper, right? Mm. Like if I if I imagine I'm great at um, swallow, I'm I'm a master at swallow. I'm just going to do this, and I go and fight someone, and he just creams me. <laughs> then, like that was my miasma, telling me I was great at swallow because I can do some forms. Yeah. But the reality is, no, that guy just just punched me in the face and I couldn't do anything about it. Yeah, yeah, true. So are you, I mean, would you consider yourself an ardent, I mean, do you do this in shamanism? Do you call yourself a proponent of shamanism or is that also falling back into the same trap? Um, I try not to talk about it to anyone. Okay, that's probably the best. That's probably the uh, best. I, yeah, because... It, it's one of those non shamanism is a non subject, right? Yeah. If you mention it to people, their eyes glaze over and they look away and they get a bit embarrassed and they think you're gonna yeah. dance around a bonfire wearing a mask over your face and banging a drum. You're gonna give them and some they, some magic mushrooms. Yeah, or, or yeah, or the whole drug side of it, which is another part thing that's been attached to it. Um, so I I I never I'm mean, gonna talk about it on podcast because it's it's related to martial arts, I think. Mm. But, you know, I never sit down if I'm on the bus next to someone and they start talking. I'm not going to go, have you heard of, have you heard the good news <laughs> about our Lord and Saviour, Mr. Shaman? Um, you know, it's not that sort of thing, right? It's, you know, it, it's not a, it's not a, a, like a, something that needs to be shy to. If people have, eventually, uh, everyone that gets to the point in their life, normally the midlife crisis, right? Where they kind of think, is there more to life than this right mm. and and for me i went and found jiu-jitsu right um but shamanism is one of the things that at that point in your life that's a good time to go and investigate it properly uh, do it from a position of strength not from a position of weakness you know mm. um because they're you know it's like everything there's loads of charlatans out there who want to take your money for of everything. course of course yeah well that's interesting to hear i mean uh, so I mean, your your podcasts are discussions on the history surrounding it. Uh, that's heretics, and then heretics. Yeah, and then woven energy is an actual, almost practical, practical thing. That yes, and that, woven energy. You have to start at episode episode one, and go forward. Okay. You can't start halfway through. It would be meaningless. Right. Like right. my teacher's book, you wouldn't understand what they were talking about. I get it. You actually have to done the things. Okay. It's very practical. It's, it, there are exercises. Go and do this. Go and do this. Go and do this. All right. That's interesting. Um, so anybody who's yeah. interested in the subject can then just start listening yeah. to those. Yeah. D and don't learn from me. I'm not qualified. Learn from Damon. He is. Okay. <laughs> and he's got a podcast which tells you how to do it. And how did he you know, get into it? Put work in. He had a, several teachers who were into it. Well, you know, Mongolia is a very shamanic society. Yeah. He had a Mongolian teacher. Um he had a Japanese teacher um, who taught this religion which was actually based on shamanism. It, it had become exotericized into a religion. In Japan? But it, um, no, he, he, he did spend some time in Japan as well. Ah, okay. Kayo, Kayo, no, Kayo, Tenri, the city Tenri. Okay. Uh, Tenrikyo is the religion. Oh, okay. And it comes from the city Tenri. So it, it's almost like a religion that has its own city. So it, it's over there, it's a big business, right? Um, they, it's a very like full on exoteric religion like Christianity is. Um, but at the heart of it, which, he, which is what the particular teacher he had, who was um, one of the bosses of... Uh, one of the Jap big Japanese firms. Um, make the cars. It's the Japanese firm that makes the cars. Oh, ja <laughs> Japanese car manufacturer. <laughs> yes. Okay, there's only um, about 30 of them. Like Mitsubishi, Honda, Toyota, Suzuki. Which one are we talking about? Toyota. Okay, Toyota. there we go. Anyway, his teacher, who taught him this shamanism stuff, was on the one of the senior executives. Ah. I think it was Toyota. I could be getting that wrong. Mm. Apologies. It's one of them anyway. Um, he's he's passed away now, unfortunately. But he was on the 
like on the board he was a senior person and he basically used this shamanism in business and a lot of what Damon does is applying he's a consultant he's a business consultant right mm. he applies um, shamanism to business and it's through the practice known as agile oh. which you might have heard of you've heard of agile work no I haven't so agile working is a really popular um, way to organize teams and it, it, it's a process and a method and you need to be trained in it and you need to implement it um, and it goes all the way through the business structure but again at its heart what it is is going back to this tribal view of humanity oh interesting um, yeah so it, it, I mean you would never say the word shamanism to anyone in business because they look at you like you're a freak right? right but if you say agile working they're like oh come and consult for us <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can revolutionize our business and it's the same thing right it's the, it's the same stuff it's just um, it's acceptable to talk about agile working um, very interesting anyway uh, so that his Japanese teacher used it in business okay and was very successful um, I think it was Honda. Was it, maybe it was Honda. Well, it was one, one of them. It was one of them. Anyway, yeah. Um, but he was into this religion, and at the heart of this religion, it all goes back to a shamaness called Miki in Japan. She started it all. She was incredibly shamanistic, didn't write anything down. Oh, maybe she did write something down. I don't know. But <laughs> you know the way that these the, the founders of these religions, like... Buddha and Jesus didn't actually write anything mm. they just did stuff and then other people wrote it down Yeah, and then it, over time it becomes more fixed and exotericized um, is it connected to Shinto at all? it's a little bit similar mm. to Shinto yes I think it is connected but it's it doesn't come out of the Shinto tradition Okay, but they are similar things have you heard of the, I think they're called Yamabushi I think they're called Yamabushi. Yeah, I think they are. Um, they're these uh, mystics that live in the mountains in Japan. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. They're they're great, aren't they? They just kind of wander about. They wander about. My my. <laughs> yeah. So a guy that used to I used to do judo uh, jujitsu with. He was uh, not not training as long, but he was actually a, a black belt of judo from Japan, and he was. Uh, right. He was the head of the ambassador security here at the embassy, the Japanese embassy here in Beijing. So he used to train with us and um, very, very skilled guy, very tough guy. He was a SWAT police officer in Japan. Um, but his grandfather was a Yamabushi, interestingly enough. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I asked him a bit of, you know, questions here and there about that. He said he didn't, he didn't really know so much about what his grandfather did. Uh, but, you know, he's... Uh, uh, he was a Yamabushi who wandered and lived in the mountains. Yeah, they're, 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 st they're like the wandering Taoists, aren't they? It's, kind um, of, yeah. Yeah, kind of. They're kind of like that, yeah. And there's, I guess, they're supported a bit by the local population who leave food out for them, right? And all right. that kind of stuff, right? Right, similar kind of thing. So very interesting. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, the thing is of uh, shamanism is it doesn't matter whether you do shamanism in Siberia, Mongolia some jungle in Peru mm. or the Amazon or anywhere mm. it, it it arises naturally and it has the same seven principles okay They're, it's always the same so rather than like a, a religion like Christianity is taught from a book they don't have a book in shamanism it comes out of nature so it's the book of M as the Rosicrucians called it ah which is the natural world so every style of shamanism has the same seven steps oh really and and those are what's yeah. being introduced as you mentioned earlier those are what he introduced yes yeah. so so basically mm. he he has influence from different styles of shamanism like some from mongolia some from japan um and he he he's observed that they just have the same steps right they just have different culture attached to them right and different words for things um and language itself is problematic because of that whole miasma thing we, we mentioned earlier yeah um you know the, the language controls your thought the, the way the words you have available to describe things controls your your thought he did a whole episode in the woven energy podcast about the word spirit in english oh okay. how in mongolian there's it, it there's like 10 words that all have slightly different meanings 
whereas in English we just say spirit. Um, yeah. Same with Shen in Chinese. It's, you know, that's just one word you could use to translate for spirit. We don't have another word for Shin. Like, they're different, they're different words in Chinese, mm. but, you know, in England you have these fudges where we say, like, people translate Shin as heart mind. It's a fudge of two words together. It kind of means it means the mind, but it kind of means the emotional mind. And as in different languages, like especially Mongolian, which is a very shamanistic culture, yeah, they have words for all these different things. Yeah, yeah, they would. We just don't have. Yeah. So he does a lot of teaching using Mongolian words. Oh, okay, that's which takes a while. To, but he explains them as he goes along. You know, um, he, he just he can't jump in in the middle because he you'll be lost. Exactly. He's talking about bat, and you're like, "What's that?" <laughs> <laughs> bat is in the animal. No, the Mongolian word. Ah, okay. Uh, it means it's like a. It's to do. Oh, I, 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 was just, I also tempted to say it in Mongolian then, and you know my Chinese pronunciation is terrible. My Mongolian pronunciation is worse. Uh, way worse. <laughs> yeah, because I've got no familiarity with it. But there's there's a phrase which means something like the way the eagle looks oh, okay. it, as it flies around, and that bat is a steadfastness. So it it its vision is its vision is open because it has to look at everything at once, but there's also a kind of a steadfastness to it. Mm. If it stops concentrating. It will never catch its prey. Right. So it has to kind of have a, like a, a, a real focus, but not a narrow focus, like an expansive view, but also very focused. focused. Yeah. Right. So that's what bat means. If you just say in English, focused, you lose all the subtlety of, I'm not narrowing down my attention. I'm keeping my attention wide, but also I'm not, I'm, I'm not, it's not wavering. Yeah. I'm not letting it drift off into other things. Yeah. So that's just an example of that. There's a word for that in Mongol. Right, but in England we just have one word focus that would describe all these subtle variations. Yeah, well, that's why a lot of the time, even like with with what I was I've been doing with this uh, translation of of Xingyi classics and things, you'll see a sentence in Chinese, but it'll be five paragraphs of explanation in English. You know, it's the same exactly. kind of thing. So. Exactly, it's the same kind of thing. Chinese is is more rich in the words it has for things in martial arts mm. than, than, than English is. But Mongolian is like another stage again. It's, it's still got all this... Because its, it's culture was more shamanistic for longer. Yeah, well, even... <laughs> before, I'm, before it got the Industrial Revolution, you know. Even their type of, uh, their type of Buddhism, which is Tibetan-derived, and Tibetan yes. Buddhism is... Yeah. is the original Bon religion of Tibet is a shamanistic religion, so yeah. their type. So they, they've had kind of a meld. Two streams of yeah. They've had two streams of shamanism in Mongo, Mongolia. They've had the Tibetan stuff, yeah, which is shaman. It's come via Buddhism, but it's shamanistic in origin, like you just said. Yeah, but they also have their own. They have their indigenous own indigenous yeah one as well, yeah. It's funny. I was it's actually with some things. people from Turkey once, and I, I asked them, because I know that. Um, well, if you know the history of the Turkish people and where they originate from, the Turkic tribes in Central Asia, and, and they're more connected to the Mongolian uh, yes. people. Well, I asked one Turkish guy, I said, do you know what Tungri is? And he's like, yes. Which is the Mongolian name for, you know, the heavens or the blue sky, or you know, which is, you know, the... Uh, uh, difficult to explain. But he said, yes. I said, oh, you, you guys still remember what that is? Because that's their old religion as well. He said, yes, it was, mm. it's our old religion when we were still stupid. That was the exact word he said to me. <laughs> uh, so I said, okay, well, nice to meet you too. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before we got communism. <laughs> no, this was a, a Turkish guy. A Turkish guy. Oh, Turkey, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, it was before they, they obviously became Islamicized. So they, they still have the right. remnants of, of their older aspects uh, which were which, which would have come from the the the, the mongolian type tribes exactly they, the exactly turkish so, people yeah yeah exactly so, so that's quite interesting anyway well it's been really good talking i've kept you on for two and a half hours we've gotten finally gotten this done gotten your i wanted to get your backstory get your ideas and things we can do this again sometime 
but thanks for coming on it was great yeah man thanks that was um that was really good i feel like i'm all talked out so good good <laughs> what i'll do is i'll put any of your our you know your thanks for having me no problem it's my pleasure and we'll put your whatever you want publicly in terms of contact or other endeavors that you you know your links to your blog your podcast and other things that you want i'll put them in the descriptions and the notes and then people if they reach out that's how they'll be able to find out cool. more about you so uh, apologies for for dragging this down into shamanistic talk at the end <laughs> no it's been interesting i mean it's it's something i'm not really knowledgeable on so it was interesting to hear a bit about it so yeah and uh, yeah it's been a pleasure thank you very much all right you have a good day and we'll chat soon and you. bye, bye, bye.